Stokers of Stoke Nation, this is Chad Kroger coming in with the Going Diva Chad JT podcast. Guys, before we begin, I remind you once again that we are brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped, thank you so much for keeping our trims pubed, for looking after our hogs, for making sure that we're looking fresh and clean. And use code go 20 at manscaped.com to get 20% off. I'm here with my compadre, John Thomas. What up? Boom clap, Stokers. And we're here with our guest, Robert Moeller, today. Um former Navy SEAL, and um, JT, do you want to give a little intro as well? Yeah, I'll do it as best I can. Uh, this is our first time meeting, so what up, Robert? Pleasure to meet yeah. you. What up? Yeah. What up, guys? Happy to be How here. You? How you living? Good, man. Good. Can't complain. Good. Um, well, yeah, so Robert, you uh, are a former Navy SEAL, and now you work for the SEAL Futures Foundation, which does uh, research and, and um helps uh, push forward treatment for with kind of unconventional methods for, for former soldiers, correct? Yeah, so SEAL Future Foundation is um, a, a nonprofit that supports transitioning veterans, but more specifically Navy SEALs. And the myth about, you know, you know, SEALs, there's the books, the silly books and the silly movies and all those things is, uh, I think it's pretty relevant to, to what's going on now is that, listen, most of us have been cooped up in some environment for a couple months now. And it's, it, there's going to be mental scar tissue for all of us that have been, you know, whether you're in the States or anywhere that's, you know, anybody, anybody's listening to this, mm -hmm. you take that same type of environment. And you, you know, if I took both of you guys to a country Acme, if you will, and put you in an environment where people wanted to kill you or hurt you for six months, there's going to be a change in you. You know, just like we're, there's a change in all of us because of what's going on with this pandemic. And I just use that as an example, because it's one of those things where you can't expect somebody to do that repeatedly over and over and over again and not have some physical and mental scar tissue to work through. And, you know, the current environment that is, um, you know, the, the acceptable medical system, and I'm not shitting on anything that, that is out there for individuals, but there's other stuff out there that people can do to, to mitigate and help uh, and, and not be hopped up on pills that, um, you know, can, can, can pretty much make you a zombie for, for a lot of the day. Were you aware of this when, like while you were serving? Like, did you see it actively happening or did it take like you transitioning out to kind of reflect on it? Yeah, I don't, you know, I can only speak from my own experience. You know, when you're young, you know, I got into the, the, the military in my 20s and all I wanted to do was, you know, go overseas and, and do cool shit or, or, you know, whatever that, whatever I thought that was back in the day. And I don't, I, I wasn't able to see it to answer your question. You don't realize how fast that train is going until you get off of it. And once you get off of it and you're by yourself and you're not with the, the people that are living and breathing the same type of stuff that you're living and breathing, you realize that you're, you've been living a different type of life and you've been living in a different type of environment. And then you got to go home and look at your kids who you may or may not know and this woman that you married maybe a couple of years ago or 20 years ago, or whatever it may be. And you have to rebuild all of that. Like dad's not leaving again ever, hopefully. And it's one of those things where you have to rebuild the relationships. You have to rebuild so many things on top of transitioning out of an environment that you've been in for, you know, again, I'll use my own personal experience, 14 years. And I didn't know how to function. I was a very fucked up person. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. I was a super fucked up. Like I was not functioning and I was pretending to all my family and friends that I was. And, um, you know, it's just like being in any type of funk that I'm sure we've all experienced, whether it's an hour a day, two weeks, whatever, you know, when you go through that, you're, I was embarrassed, you know, I, I was supposed to be this big, bad, badass, tough person that have done all these things. And I didn't even want to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where, uh, and it wasn't most days, it wasn't all the days, but it was some days. And those some days were bad. And then, you know, it just trickles and starts from there. And, and eventually um, it all catches up with you. How did you get to a point where you could talk about it? Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, in, in an environment like this, it, it took a lot of stages. And if I had... If anybody can take anything away and they have a veteran in their life, if they're at the stage where they're still not okay talking about it, you know, there's a saying inside a SEAL Future Foundation where, um, you know, there's a difference between like a, a scar and a cut. 
you know, a scar is something that you can look down and look at like the chicks or, or wherever in a bar and be like, I got this because I got bit by a shark. You know, that cut is still fresh, you know, and they're not ready to talk about it. Now, some, some individuals aren't ever ready to talk about it, but that's another conversation or something I would tackle differently. You know, when it comes to being ready to talk about it, I forced myself to get up in front of people and talk about my experience. And uh, when you talk to people that were in the room for the first time, I mean, I ugly cried. I ugly cried in front of hundreds of people talking about my experience because I was still very much in that cut phase of talking through the, the vulnerability and the, the bad mistakes that I did. Um, where now I can sit here with you guys and just talk about it pretty casually because I've burned those reps and now it's a scar. But I think other people whether you're a veteran or not, are going to benefit from hearing the the conversation from some badass ex Navy SEAL being like, guys, it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to say you're not okay and it's okay to ask for help and all that shit. What did it feel like when you had that ugly cry? Like, what was like the like afterwards? Uh, I felt relief. My family was in the room and it was, man, I, I'm emotional talking about it now. It was, um, it was the first time that I let people know that I was struggling and I wasn't okay. And I was able to hug my family afterwards. And that was therapeutic in itself. You know, just being around people that know how bad things were for you. And it's crazy because I'm sure you guys have experienced this. Like you guys do something, you guys make people laugh. You guys entertain people. You guys enlighten other people in whatever form it may be. And people I'm sure have come up to you on the street and be like, Hey man, thank you. You know, and in that environment where I was super vulnerable and ugly crying and had snot come out of my nose, I had probably five or six people come up to me and say, I've been there. You're not alone. And thank you for sharing that. And that's how I knew that shit like this, having conversations like this is something that's going to be a part of me and give me purpose. Um, because I just know I don't, I don't like it when people suffer. And if I can mm. tell people like not to suffer, it's okay to be vulnerable and, and, and ugly cry and, and do all those things. I've done okay. You know what I mean? For sure. Totally. What's the, uh, what do you think the, the fear is that keeps us from feeling like we can be vulnerable? Like, is it that we worry people won't love us if we're vulnerable or that they'll reject us or, or that, that might be me projecting. Um, <laughs> well, I think, think it's, I think what it's think individualized, it you know? And, and what I mean by that is like, if you think about it, you know, if you've never been broke before, which I have, you know, if you've never, if you've never not known, what it's like when you have a kid or, or or whatever, and you don't know how you're going to pay the bills. Like that's scary as a, as an adult, but even before you, you turn into an adult, the think about high school, think about all those silly years that it never mattered. Like you just wanted to be accepted. You just wanted to be cool. You wanted to be like everybody else. And in the background, now looking back on it, like we all know so many people from our early years, whether it was high school or whatever it may be that we knew they were suffering and we may have made fun of them or they just didn't talk about it. And you find out later on that, you know, they weren't okay. And I think there's something about our society where when you stand up and you say like, I'm not okay. Cause I'm struggling because my parents got divorced or I'm struggling because I did 12 pushes overseas in a combat environment. Like I'm not okay. I don't really think we have a culture right now that makes it okay to have that conversation because I think we are fearful that people might look at me different or people might think that, um, you know, they don't know what to do with me because I stood up and, and, and said that I wasn't okay. And I'll give you an example of this, like as a veteran, and again, not to make it veteran centric, because I think we all experience this in different forms or fashion is, you know, when you go as a veteran and you, and you go start working for a, a, a you know, company outside of the, outside of the military and like in the civilian space, a lot of companies have veteran programs, but even when you sit down in your cubicle or whatever environment that you're now in, like people are like, are you going to freak out? Like, are, are, like, what was, what was this like? Did you ever do this? You know, and, and just ask dumb shit because they don't know how to deal with you in a way that, cause they're, they're watching the movies, they're reading the books and, um, Going back to your question, as far as like, you know, what do we think that is? I, I think we're always trying to see like safe, not safe. Okay, not okay. And I think that culture of I always am okay and I'm not vulnerable because we're fearful that we might not be accepted. Well, and it seems mm -hmm. like, is, would you, would it be dangerous if you were active and overseas to like 
tell the people you're working with, like, hey, I'm, I don't feel okay? Like, could that jeopardize, like, confidence or something like that? I think it depends on how it's done, you know? And, and, and I think you owe that to your teammates, whether it's uh, in, a, in a special operations environment or in a conventional environment. And, and what I mean by that is, it doesn't matter if you're going overseas and you're a soldier or you're on a basketball team or you're just surfing with a buddy. Like mm -hmm. if you're not okay and you're thinking about, you know, I don't know, whatever that's bothering you. And you have somebody that's about to drop in on you on a wave and you miss it because you're too busy or you could have told your buddy that like, you should have been honest and been like, Hey, this is the shit that's bothering me. You want to talk about it? Like, I don't think anything bad comes out of that ever. So I think, yeah, I, I think you owe that to the individuals. Now I wouldn't do it in the middle of an op when I'm getting shot at, but I, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, ah, oh, I'm sorry yeah. guys, you, you know, but yeah. I, I think there's the right way and a wrong way. And if, if you're not talking to people about where you're at, truly you're doing yourself a disservice and the people around you. Cause when it caves in, people are like, Oh, I didn't know. And that sucks. Mm. Did, did you, did you have a, a, a bad experience with sort of pharmaceuticals and stuff, all that kind of stuff um, that comes with therapy, like the medication, like what, what sort of led you to find these alternative um, yeah. uh, forms of therapy, like, like uh, psilocybin and stuff like that? I, I didn't actually, I, I actually never had, and I'm very lucky here. I, I never went down the road of pharmaceuticals because I know me and I know my mm. personality and it doesn't matter if it's surfing, running, and you're noticing I'm saying like nothing like drinking because if it's drinking, like I'm in, I'm, I'm in. Yeah. Like I, that's just my personality. Like it's not because uh, I can't stop and, and not to be whatever, but I just like to go deep on anything I'm into, like yeah. anything. For example, coffee, I, I roast my own coffee because it's infinite. I never will figure it out. You know, that that's just <laughs> my mentality. Yeah. Um, but, but when it comes to that type of stuff, I actually – was um, we did a for the for the Seal Future Foundation? We did something called the Spectre Series, and the Spectre Series was an event where we jumped out of an airplane in San Diego with you know military gear on. We swam two miles, and then after we got out of the airplane, I'm sorry, after we hit land, we we donned military kit again and ran a hundred miles. So it was a hundred and two mile event, and we did it in like 33 hours. Uh, what led me to my really holistic recovery modality type of journey was when I started training for this, I was, let's just say, I don't know, uh, 210 pounds. When I, when I, when I stepped on the scale after we had jumped on the, off the, out of the plane and swam two miles, I was 232. I ran a hundred miles at 232 pounds. Wow. Now what scared the shit out of me, and I didn't tell anybody this was I was training for a hundred miler and then some, and I gained like 20 something pounds and my endocrine system, my whole body was completely off and I was eating clean, wasn't drinking. Like there's no reason why I should be carrying around this, inf this much inflammation. And, um, you know, I was, I was pretty scared in that 32 hours. Cause I thought I was going to die, not because I was in pain, but I, I shouldn't not, I shouldn't have weighed that much. And I knew something was really off. So, um, after that moment, I just told myself, I'm going to figure it out my way and I'm not going to rely on the pills and all that shit. And that's kind of got me into cryotherapy. Cryotherapy got me into acupuncture, acupuncture. And again, I just started mm -hmm. going deep, um, to where we ended up, you know, now we're having a conversation about it. So, uh, it, it all started because of physical event. And I was, I would walk down the steps guys during that time before that hundred miler or 102 miler. And I would be in serious pain. You know, I would walk down two or three flights of steps. I'm sorry, two or three steps. And I knew um, what type of day I was going to have mm. because of all of the pain that I had, you know, surging through my body with those first couple of steps on the, you know, in the morning. And, and what caused the, uh, the sort of, what, what sort of caused the, your endocrine system to, to sort of yeah. have all those issues and stuff? Like what caused the weight gain? I don't, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I can say that, you know, from a, from my standpoint, from a uh, soldier standpoint, you know, SEAL standpoint, call it whatever, from military standpoint, what's pretty acceptable across the board is lack of sleep. And I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but I can tell you that at this point now with the research that's out there, there is no disputing that sleep is a catalyst to either all things good or all things really fucking bad. 
if I don't sleep a lot, I have the potential to be, you know, have carry around more anxiety. Uh, I'm not going to recover as much. I can gain weight, you know, all these things again, where I'm sleeping eight hours a night, there's a difference between eight hours and quality sleep and I won't get into it. But, you know, just because I'm sleeping eight hours, doesn't mean I'm getting eight quality hours of sleep. Yeah. Um, I realized very, very early on that I had been sleeping uh, anywhere between, I wasn't sleeping at all. And when I was, I was sleeping about four hours, but the quality sleep that I was getting within those four hours, probably about 25 minutes total. Wow. And that's the first thing I changed. And I did that through, um, you know, a company called whoop, uh, and transparency. I work for them now, but, uh, it's one of those things and I'm not plugging anybody or any, anything, but it's just one of those things where that was the thing that changed my life because I was able to see as a, as a veteran, how bad I really was. And one thing that that gave me was accountability. So what am I doing wrong that I can fix? And I was seeing that and I started with my sleep and then I started with how stressed I was during the day. And I was able to start mitigating these things through holistic modalities like cryotherapy. How does cryotherapy af affect me as an individual when I, sleep, when I get cryotherapy and go to sleep and, and don't drink? And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, it does this. It increases my sleep quality by this much. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, what about acupuncture? Well, that decreased mine. And, and you just start stacking. Yeah. Um, so I was a self-experiment. You know, I was an experiment on myself, but I was using wearable technology and also um, holistic modalities to, to figure it out and crack the nut. Cause I didn't know what was wrong with me. I just knew that I was fucked up. Dude, I, I, um, I love ice baths. I, I'm living into, into a new place. I, I want to get a big freezer so I can just hop in that thing. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have so many toys. I, I mean, infrared yeah. sauna. I have, oh, uh, yeah. actually we're getting a float tank. Uh, that's oh, the next sweet. thing. It's going to be, be in this month. And then, uh, you know, and then the uh, cold float. And so I'll go from an infrared yeah. sauna into a uh, 30 degree you know, degrees Fahrenheit, you know, mm -hmm. soaking in water and then call it good. But even those little things, it takes me, you know, 25 minutes total in the morning. I sleep yeah. that much better mm -hmm. just because of that recovery modality that I'm putting in, um, which again, it all stems on that works for me. But if all three of us went overseas and experienced the same thing at the same time, all of our responses will be individualized. So what might mm -hmm. help me might not be good for JT and vice versa. So it's always right. individualized. And that's a big piece is that, you know, healthcare shouldn't be, you know, not that we're talking about big farm, big, big farm or anything like that, but like what's going to affect you isn't going to affect me and vice versa. Mm. Totally. It's like some, it's like with diets sometimes like people are like, Oh, this diet works. That I'm like, look, some people are allergic to peanuts. Other people yeah. aren't. It takes like different strategies for, but how do you yeah. keep people? I guess the hardest part for me, I had, uh, or I have mental health issues and it took me a long time to find what works and I'm on uh, medication, but it, but it works for me. But, but the hard part was like, and the thing that people message me about is like when it doesn't work the first time, how do you, or the second time or the third time, it can take a while to find what works for you. So yeah. how, how did you like stay, uh, how did you have the stamina to keep looking for what was the thing that was going to help you? <laughs> Motivation. I didn't want, I didn't, I didn't want my kid to grow up, you know, without a dad, you know, and, and, and in those moments, and I will tell anybody, whether you're married or not married or have kids or don't have kids, if you know you're banged up and you're not okay and you do deal with mental issues, I mean, you're just one or two bad decisions away from clacking yourself off, whatever that looks like. I don't know because it's individualized for every person. But um, like I said, when I get into something, whether it's coffee or mental health or you know whatever it may be, I go really fucking deep. And I wasn't gonna stop because of that ugly cry that I had back in San Diego that was my driving force to figure out if I can figure this out for me, then, you know, maybe I can help JT or maybe, maybe I can, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just, if I'm fucked up and I'm, and I'm going to go through the journey, I might as well take that knowledge and give it to somebody else. And if it works for them, great, but at least it can get them thinking. And that's the whole goal here is just to get mm -hmm. people thinking about, um, you know, do you really want to take a pill for your whole life? And, and, and maybe that's okay. Like for me, uh, I was taking testosterone and a bunch of other things for um, a short period of time. I would say probably, probably two or three months by a doctor. This isn't like bro science, like regulated, you know, all that stuff. I did steroids in high school. But did you? Doctor. Yeah, I got yoked. Um, Wait, did you get sorry. big? Yeah, I put on some serious. I mean, I did it for vanity purposes. Yeah. I did. I did a site. Well, I guess I can say this now. I did a cycle um, when I shouldn't have. And uh, for those purposes, um, and it worked great. 
Oh, yeah, it worked. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> I mean, you can, and, you can uh, work out twice in a day. And, oh, and my God. It, it, it works yeah. so good. Uh, but it's just one of those things where it's not sustainable. And, and not, to my yeah. point, right. And to my point um, is when I, when I was taking testosterone and a bunch of other shit, I was sticking myself with a needle every day or every other day or twice a day. And I was like, this sucks. This can't be my life for the next 45 years because I, this, yeah. I, this isn't sustainable. So it was just one of those things where I wanted to be able to do something that was holistic and natural, not fuck me up uh, on, on a mental or physical side. And I wouldn't be dependent on it for the rest of my life. And that was my criteria. Nice. Yeah. What What's your uh, sort of holistic routine, like daily routine to sort of uh, optimize your day? Uh, that's a great question. I, and again, it's individualized and this is over years and years of me trying to figure it out. I'm a big, mm-hmm. big believer in meditation. When you think about like breath, breath work and, and you know, there's so many great guys out there. You think of, you know, um, I don't know. You, you think of the Larry Iceman, Hamilton. you think of, you know, Larry mm-hmm. Hamilton, you think all, I mean, they got it, they get it. And it's one of those things where nothing we do from, from, from fighting to, to sex, it all has to do with breath work in some capacity, right? Mm-hmm. Right. That's, I mean, it really, it really does. Yeah. And uh, if you're into jujitsu or any of those things and someone takes your airway, you, your eyes get real big because you're like, Oh, I can't breathe. Now uh, if you, if you really spend time there and manipulate that and start really understanding, you know, how you, you know, your, your, your breath work is affecting your whole being. And I'm not trying to get woo woo here, but hold your breath for as long as possible and look at something really bright or really colorful. And you're, you're going to get that jolt. Um, so big believer in meditation. And that's where I spend a lot of my morning. I have, you know, from six to nine, knock, knock, like nobody touches that time for me. And it's for, it's for, you know, fitness, family, and focus. And those are the three, the three things that I focus on. And in my focus time, um, you know, I'm, I'm in, the, in, in the infrared sauna first thing in the morning. I'm, I'm cranking it up to 130 degrees. I'm getting in there and I'm getting a sweat going. In the time that I'm in the infrared sauna, I am going through a meditation anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes, just trying to let go of tension, failure. And I'll get into this when we talk about uh, some of the other he- heavy, you know, uh, psychedelic stuff that's out there. Um, failure tension, anything that pissed me off the day before an email, all that stuff. I'm just trying to let it go. Uh, and then outside of that, uh, I set my intention for the day, meaning like I'm going to get these three things done professionally. I'm going to go outside with my kid. I'm going to be a, a, a great husband, whatever, like all those things. And then uh, I get out, hop in the, the, the cold soak, get that done. And then I'm, then I'm on, then it's family time until I have to start working. But um and that's my morning routine. I don't have to wake up at 4.30. I, I work out in that time too. So, I mean, between six to nine, and then after I get out of the sauna, have coffee, do that thing, go work out. And then by nine o'clock, I'm, I'm you know, working or doing something. Um, but if I, if I slip out of that routine in any of those forms, whether I don't spend time with the people that I care about or the, or, or, or the focus in, in, the, in, the, um, in the sauna, or if I don't work out, I'm off. I can't have a conversation like this. I'll have brain fog. I, I won't be the best version of myself. And uh, that drives me batshit. And on the days that I skip it because nobody's perfect or, or don't do all three, um, I'm not as good as I could be. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I uh, you know, in my, in my early 20s, got really into this stuff as well. And it's and then once you become aware, I found that once you become aware of it, once you become aware of how sensitive your, your, your mind and your body are, um, it, it's, I'm the same way too. If I don't get enough sleep, if I don't, yep. you know, get some kind of workout in, I, I just feel off. Um, and there's just, uh, I totally relate to that. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just that, that optimization. Do you feel slower or do you feel like, do you feel like you just can't form a thought do you feel like brain fog or do you feel like lethargic do you feel it physically or mentally or maybe both i think uh a lot of it is anxiety yeah Uh, i feel more anxiety and i feel i think brain fog anxiety and brain fog i think are the two 
Um, uh, yeah. And just a lack of uh, a little bit, you know, my drive is just a lack of drive, I'd say. Yeah. Um, but I think the biggest thing is sort of, a um, anxiety because a lot of what, you know, with what we do, it's like comedy and stuff. It's like, it's self-motivated, you know, you got to get, we have to create our own content, all that kind I of love, stuff. I love the, it's an art form, you know, and, yeah. and in order to do it well and do it right. And, and I'm yeah. not, a, you know, anywhere close to being, uh, a comedic, you know, comedic in any sense or form, but it's a no shit art form. And you have to eat a lot of shit in order to yeah. understand what's funny and yeah. not funny. And sometimes the things that you think are funny, aren't funny. And then you're like, yeah. well, that didn't go the way I thought it would, but yeah, we were trying know. to do, yeah. we were trying to do TikTok videos where we just come across as horny in them. And when we thought about <laughs> it, we thought it was the best idea in history. And then in actuality today, we were like, it's kind of uncomfortable. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, right. Yeah. Because yeah. I was being so, I was this close to the camera, and I was really translating my my sexual energy, and it was it was overwhelming for me as a viewer. It's awesome. And when you yeah. when you say that you have anxiety, do you have anxiety of creating content? Do you have anxiety of just like I got to be funny today? Like, what's the anxiety? And, and JT, that's for for you too. Like, do you, do you guys feel pressure to to be you guys all the time, or do you guys actually de- you know throttle down? behind closed doors. And if you don't want to share that, it's fine. But like, do you guys throttle down and just be like, I'm just going to turn it off right now? I think uh, for me, uh, it's a combo of, um, I always have to feel like I'm being productive. Like I'm, like I'm, I'm, I'm pushing my life forward in a positive direction. Right. Uh, Especially with what we do, you know, it's like, we're in, we're in entertainment Hollywood, you know, and it's such like, um, it's so fickle, I guess. Maybe that's the right word. Uh, where it's just sort of like, you know, you, you got to, I always feel like I have to continually create my future. You know, yeah. it's not like I'm in it, in the Hollywood, in the vows of under Hollywood, like that fragile thing that is Hollywood. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think so. Where it's sort of like, you know, it's like, um, it's sort of like if, if you can, you can lose it kind of thing. <laughs> sure. Yeah. My Siri it's a pressure. I mean, you feel, you feel um, pressure there. I so imagine. it's sort of like, uh, I have all these like goals I want to meet. I, I think a lot of it is sort of like, I, I, I have this ideal career that I'm working towards and I just always want to be moving in that direction. And it's kind of like up to us to make it happen. Um, yeah. and so, right. and it, it requires a ton of self-motivation each day. And so I just, I have anxiety about continually, moving that direction. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I think it sounds like there's, there's a little bit of pressure there. It seems like it. I, I can't even imagine oh, the, sorry, the level Mike. of pressure that, that might, uh, might be, be that comes with all of that. So, I mean, that, that makes complete sense and feeling anxiety around that, especially if you have a vision and you want to, everybody wants to continue growth. Sorry, I can't you know? hear for some reason. Are you out? Um, I don't know. Can you hear me or no? I can hear you. Okay. He lost comms. sounds like. I think his uh, earphones died. Oh. Headphones. I think he's going to hop back in. Um, was, it, was it hard for you? Like, because um, you, you seem to have like a real uh, intense focus. You know, like you're, you're very focused, right? Uh, that's a weird way to phrase it. But, no, I, I mean, I'm just like everybody else, you know, in the sense I that. I don't know, though. You don't seem like everybody else. Well, I, I think that's good. Yeah, no, um, I think you're exceptional. No, I, I think I probably I don't turn red, but if I did, uh, you, you know, I, I think it's one of those things where I wouldn't mistake exceptional for passionate in, in the sense where like, I mean, we're all, we're all battling the same shit. You know, at the end of the day, everybody just wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be accepted. Most people want to do epic shit. I know I do, you know, and, and, and I think, if we keep that in mind and just be open and, and vulnerable, I think we're good to go. But it's, it's one of those things where in order for me to be balanced, I have to do, you, you got to put it in the work. And, and it's one of those things where I think I learned that pretty early on, where if I'm not willing to put in the work, I'm, I'm going to end up a shit show, you know? For sure. Yeah. And the, and the fear of that is, is highly it motivating. Sucks. But where yeah, did and I- that maybe, right. That's maybe that's why there's anxiety there. Maybe that's why, you know, like you guys are very public people and I can't even imagine like, what if one day you woke up and you weren't like, that's a lot of pressure. Oh, I can't yeah. even imagine that. The I movie, can't even imagine. Do you see the movie hoop dreams? It's that documentary about those two inner city high school basketball players. And 
the one guy, he's like, he's, everyone thinks he's going to be a star. And they're like, right. hey, man, don't forget about me when you're a star. And he's just talking to the camera, doing like a confessional. He's like, I always want to say to them, don't forget about me if I don't. And you're like, oh my gosh, man. And he's 16. So powerful. Time. So power. Did he make it? Did he? He made it where he's living a good life, but he didn't make it in terms of what people expected right. of him in basketball terms. Yeah. Right. So, so I guess not. But, but you know, there's, uh, I don't know. It's like, it's like a, you know, we, we find. Uh, How powerful, man. Shit. How powerful yeah. is that statement is don't forget about me when I'm not. Yeah, that famous. he knows what's at stake. He knows how, like yeah. Chad said, fickle it is. But I was going to ask, did you always have that kind of, were you always worried about that? Like, were you worried about that when you, before you got into the military or did it kind no. of foster as you got older? No, I didn't. I, you know, I think it's, it's one of those things, what you don't know is what you don't know, you know, and, and what was important to me, I'm 41. So what's important to me as a 41 year old wasn't even on the grid at, you know, 24 or 25 this completely different world you know just like you know i don't know how old you are but it's one of those things where 10 years ago you were like this shit's not like you're not thinking the same way you know yeah was so were you just having fun when when you were in the military was it a was i was it, trying uh, you know <laughs> was i was i having fun is that a weird way to phrase the, it no i think that's a, gr a great way to put it i think yeah i was having fun but i also wasn't sleeping i also was drinking a lot you know i was traveling around the world and I, I was doing things that not a lot of people get to do. And I'm really thankful for that. And, I, and, and that's great. And that's cool. Um, I just think that I should have been a little bit more focused on both the, uh, like I was telling, telling you before, you know, Chad dropped off, is, is it's one of those things where what do you guys do to down, like deregulate? What do you guys do to, to, to throttle down? whether that's on a, a daily or weekly basis, I didn't do any of that for probably, I don't know, 14 years. And if I did do it, it was in like maybe a five day spurt of going on leave. And then it was right back at it. So. And it was probably hedonistic, right? It was not. Yeah. It was, you know, raging. Yeah. Right. It was a <laughs> yeah. raging, it was a, it was an inferno and we burned at a thousand degrees until we couldn't burn anymore. And then we got three or four hours of sleep and then we did it again. But it, and, that's but, on, but, and that's on me and, and that's my fault, you know, but, but I didn't okay. know. Anybody. I mean, it works yeah. when it works. It works while it works. Right. And it, and right. It, you need another way to nourish. Yourself. And then it gets, and then you have somebody, right. And then you have it, you need to find another, um, you need to find another release. But what's really interesting there is, and I can only speak for special operations when it comes to this topic, but it's one of those things where there's a certain level of, um, I, there's a certain level of acceptance or there's a certain level of, you're not thinking the same way as most people when you're, when your job is to go into another place, sneak in there, do what you need to do. Let's say on a, like eliminate a target, sneak out, and not talk about it ever again. And, I, and I'm not trying to sound like the movies and I'm not trying to sound like the books, but if you're doing it right and you're not making books and movies, that's the way it's supposed to be. And uh, that trickles down to all aspects of your life because if your threshold is jumping out of an airplane at 35,000 feet with hundreds of pounds of gear on, and that's your excitement level at, at midnight, and you're going to look for somebody and you're hunting somebody, what do you think is going to happen when I get to Vegas? What do you think is going to happen when I have seven days of leave and you let me loose in the gas lamp district in San Diego? Like it's a, it's a mess. You're, you're going to be a mess. And if I, and if I spent that time before and was more in touch with my uh, throttling down, in those in those in those moments day after day week after week i, I would have been good to go I, I would have been better off i wouldn't have been such an inferno uh in vegas or san diego or wherever i was i, I have that too where i like you know and and uh i know not i not as extreme but it's just like I, I have this sort of um you know like this need to work super hard but then like to play hard Right. But I found that as I've gotten older, you know, with like drinking and stuff, it's like my, my brain is so sensitive now that, that, that that's like, I always have to look for all, now I'm sort of looking for alternative ways to sort of um, let loose in, in such an, in a less destructive way. 
Do you guys, do you decompress a lot? Do you guys actually take the time to decompress? And I know I asked that question a different way um, before Chad dropped out, but um, do you guys take the time weekly, daily? Not at all? Kind of sometimes? I do, I, do, I do Wim Hof breathing. I exercise. Nice. I try to sleep. I, I actually, I throw a lot at it, but I do find that it's hard for me to sit still. I, I really can't. I'll force myself to read just to read like pages out of a book. But even that I'm like, really I'm bouncing all over the place every two pages. Yeah. Um, but I try, I try. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've found, uh, I, I try to surf as much as I can. So I found, you know, like the, the benefit of getting in touch with nature, just being in the ocean 100%. water, like when during quarantine, when they shut down the beaches, I was like, you know, I was like, how am I supposed to relax? <laughs> what am I supposed to do here, guys? There's, yeah. there's some things you can't take away from me. And that's one of them. I'm with you on that. So uh, uh, like uh, getting in ocean water, I've found, you know, I do, I do Wim Hof breathing and, and, and I've done yoga Nitra too. Yep. Uh, this, this neuroscientist, Andrew Huberman, I, I'm a fan of, he, he talks about yoga Nidra, which is like a sort of full body meditation, I guess you'd yep. call it. Yep. Um, that I've found really boosts my mood in the morning. So nice. Uh, yeah. Nice. How do you, how do you feel during the day after you do that? Do you, after you burn a rep in the morning, you feel pretty clear and, and focused or you feel like you kind of fall apart midday? Uh, clear and focused. Yeah. I think one thing I, I if I cut out, you know, I, I was like vaping and stuff mm -hmm. and that was really affecting my brain, you know, it was affecting yeah. my sleep and stuff. So I cut that out. And now I feel, I feel great throughout the day, but now I'm just drinking a ton of coffee. So now I'm getting that crash. <laughs> so it's always like you were saying, it's constant experiments. Uh, just like, uh, you're a little, uh, you're, uh, you're choppy. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> uh, hold on. Let me make sure. Sorry guys. Yeah, no worries. All right. I think we got it yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. There we go. All right. I, I appreciate Woo. this podcast so much more now because of what we've been through to get here. There, there you go. There, there you go. You know, no, no pressure to, 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 to be funny here. I don't know. No, no that's true. It's true. Um, um, JT, are, are you recording? Yes, I am. Okay, cool. Okay. So, um, yeah. yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'll just say the question again. So I'm um, hearing you talk about going ballistic in San Diego on the weekends. It, it made me envious of the, probably the uh, the camaraderie you must have had with your with the people you worked with. And did you always have like a group of bros? And how did that how does it how does that feel to have like a group of bros when you're going through the things you go through together in the Navy SEALs? Yeah, I mean that that group of guys, man. You know it it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. It's a curse. It's a love hate relationship because it's one of those things where, you know, when you, when you go back and you start thinking about the, the guys that I went through training with, to give you an example, you know, 168 guys started in, in my class in, in, the, in, in buds and um, 23 of those individuals, you know, finished, started the same day, started the, that first day and ended up graduating. Wow. Um, and then you multiply that by, you know, and an example of this would be like, I talked about that 102 miler, my, my, my swim buddy, my like partner, when I was going through training, hasn't texted me, emailed me, called me in forever, saw that I was doing that. And that morning and true, like his name is Jake, Jake fashion texts me and goes, Hey man, I know what you're about to do. And if you die, I love you, bro. And that's it. Like hasn't talked to me in 10 years, but just wow. keeps his finger on the pulse to the point where like, I know exactly what you're doing. And if you die today, good, good job. And I love you. Like that's yeah. the type of shit that you're talking about. So when you take that type of, you know, creepiness, if you will, and, and apply that to uh, the bros, it can be a real good thing or it can be a real good bad, or it can be a bad thing. And, and the, and the good piece is, you know, you're, you're with guys that will hop, you know, happily jump in front of a bullet for you and not even think twice about it. That's a fucking powerful thing. The other side of that though, is they will also be the first ones to be like, let's turn the lights off while we're going down this road in Mississippi after you've been drinking four cases of beer and, and see, you know, how, how, you know, and light the tires on fire. I don't know, whatever, right. you know? And, and, and so, you know, what is sword. acceptable? Yeah. I mean, cause you're going to, you're going to drive each other. You're going to push each other. 
whether that's in the positive direction or the negative direction. And I think it's, it's all out of love, but it's one of those things where if your crew, again, if your bros are traveling around the world together and doing what you're doing, and then that there's that time for release, it, it's, it's a, it's a powder keg and it can be, mm. and it can be really dangerous. What was your role in the, in the group dynamic? Like what kind of, what was your kind of like uh, function? <laughs> You know, I'm a pretty laid back guy and I'm sure a lot of people are laughing at that. Um, and maybe that's the old, 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 like the 41 year old talking, mm -hmm. but I mean, I got into that whole environment pretty late in the game. I, I mean, I got in, into the special operations when I was 25 and I'd already gone to college and stuff and I did a lot of partying in college. So I already kind of got that on my system. Mm -hmm. So it's whatever it was. It was like, I'll go to the bars and hang out. I'll get into a couple fights here and there, you know, but I wasn't raging because I was more focused on when am I going to get back overseas? When I, when am I going to, you know, um, maybe I'm lying there. I, I party a lot. <laughs> but, but you, I party. You seem, and I, I only know you now, but you seem like you might've been the guy who was like getting them out of trouble. Like maybe I, it, was mixture, it, it was a mixture, man. It was a mixture. I had my fair share and, and, and I'm thinking about this and I'm like, don't fucking lie. Like you, you know, and I'm not trying to, but it's just that different perspective because you're asking me something I did almost 20 years ago now. Um, but yeah, I mean, we got after it and it was a good thing and bad thing. And I was probably both. I was the antagonist uh, a lot of the times and, and then um, probably pulling guys out of bars and, and bad situations. And, you know, I would say half and half. <laughs> That's a good balance. Good yeah. balance, right? Yeah. You got um, someone who can do both. Yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, you guys have been there, like, you know, there's a, you know, there's that one crew that you go out with or, or whatever, and you know, it's either going to be a fucking epic night or it's going to be a complete shit show. And either way you're like, I'm in. Cause these are my bros or, you know, this is my crew or whatever it may be. I have a yeah. friend who had, I always called it a fight, a fucker fight response where if he didn't have sex with someone that night, you knew he was going to start a fight with someone. Yeah. hundred percent. There's a lot of, there's a lot of those guys inside of special operations in, in the military, <laughs> as you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And you can tell exactly who that guy is the second he walks into the bar and um, he's acting like a knucklehead, you know, and it's like, I'm going to choke this guy out tonight because he thinks he's a badass and he's really not, and, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Do you know how to, so, are you, are you, some people are like good at beating people up where they don't go too far with it and really beat them up. They just like handle them. Like my friend, my friend, John Daniels, when he used to put me in my place, he'd always beat me up the perfect amount. And I really appreciated that about him. He just like controlled me and let me know that yeah. it could have hurt me. Did right. You, would, would you try to apply that kind of measure when you were choking this dude out? Yeah, I guess. Well, yeah, no, so you'd be no, we were brutal to each other. I mean, mm. and, and that's put, that's part of the, well, in my, in my, in my era, we were brutal to each other. I'm talking about like duct taping a guy, we duct taped a guy in South America to a cot that is like two feet off the ground. And we let the tide roll in and we left him taped up in the, in the jungle with a straw hanging out of his mouth for his, <laughs> and he couldn't see as the tide was washing over him. And what he didn't know, there was a guy watching him the whole time, but he oh was a God. new guy. And we taped him from, from his toes oh all the way up to his head with nothing he couldn't see and just that straw and he just knew the tide was coming in and he was taped to the stretcher was that just because oh he was god little? it's because he was being a because he was being an idiot but <laughs> but, but going back to the the tribe mentality of like the bros if we if one or three look at each other and they're like that's a good idea like he could have mm -hmm. drowned he could have died he couldn't talk you, you, you know but mm -hmm. it's that type of shit where you know, and that's nothing. I mean, we, we would get into all sorts of, you know, we would beat each other up. Guys would be going in the work the next, you know, on Monday with black eyes, broken noses, um, because it was all part of that whole piece. Like we're going to party pretty hard, but we're also going to train really hard as well. And that's all great and good. And we're laughing about it. But the backside of that is like the mental issues that come with burning it down and going that fucking hard over and over and over again you multiply that by a couple of years on yeah. top of the deployments of getting shot at and all that shit and that's what you're looking at right now was there some sweetness it, too though was, was there what was there sweetness too though man there's a lot of love there's a lot of love a lot of a, a lot of love and it's all out of love because you know you walk that fine line of of um 
there's no, especially in, in my time frame. So think like 2003 on 2004 on there was no, um, illusions of you are going to make it through this program and you're going to go overseas and do your job. And so the innocence really gets washed out of you very quickly as a young man. That's, and I'll use myself as an example. You know, I'm a young kid, 24 years old, 23 years old, thinking I'm going to go shoot bad guys. I've never been to war. You know, I've never, mm-hmm. I've, the closest I came to war was f- fucking saving private Ryan, you know? And then you, and then you go do it and you realize how ugly like the underbelly of, of, of that machine really is. And, you know, on an individual level, you di- digest it any way you can. But the other side of that is, you know, you, you need each other in those moments to where, you know, there's so much love, even though you taped me up three months ago and you left me to drown. But in this moment, like we're here together and we're going to get through this and we're going to win. And that mm-hmm. is, that is, that's where that love comes from because you know, these guys have been vetted. They've been vetted in, in multiple ways. And if, if push comes to shove, they will jump in front of that bullet for you. And that's the, I mean, self-sacrifice is the ultimate love. If, at least I, at least I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Would you guys like Did, cuddle or, or like get homoerotic <laughs> with each other? No. Well, in training. Yeah. I mean, in training to stay warm, I've had multiple of my, you know, all my friends have pissed on me because I was so <laughs> cold. I'm like, yo, you got to piss, piss on me. Cause I was that cold. Wow. But, and, and again, in any other environment, I'd be pretty upset if you pulled it out and started pissing on me, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but in that environment, I'm like, please, you know, so. <laughs> I don't know if that counts. A lot of hugging and training, a lot of trying to stay warm, truly trying to stay warm. I'm not saying I'm trying to stay warm. Like there's a, you know, a, a good looking girl in the room type of shit. So did you, when you were sort of, when you were uh, in it, uh, did you have time to, you know, uh, sort of stop and, and reflect or, or sort of like, did you have like sort of off days where you're kind of like, you know, it was after you party too hard or you just, or was it always sort of get up and go where you didn't really have time to sort of, process everything that was going on so then yeah uh, yeah no i i didn't i mean i'm not saying other people did or did not i can just only talk to my you know personal experience in the sense that that's one thing i wish i did do is actually Mm -hmm. take time to throttle down and and even if even if i wasn't mature enough to understand like i should probably take some time to make sure my own ship is is righted or right Mm -hmm. um i never did and so that's why I think I had such a struggle when I transitioned out is because I had this, you know, a 14 year time frame of, of running hard, playing hard, not taking time to decompress. And then it was like, Hey, thanks, go figure it out. And on my own doing, I left the, I left the Navy on my own accord. Um, but it is one of those things where I wasn't prepared with the fallout of transition. And that's when I became a shit mess. Yeah. And were, were you aware, like, before you transitioned out, were you sort of aware, you're like, you're like I, I know that I've probably built up a lot of shit in my head that's going to come crashing down, or did it all sort of, like, come I had no idea. None. Like, yeah. None. It, it would be like, I, it, it's like, it would be like, hey, as a middle schooler, waking up the like one day in seventh grade and then all of a sudden being in, in, in high school. And you're like, mm. what the fuck just happened? Cause that transition from like junior high to high school is completely, you know, that's a different yeah. environment. Mm. And that's a really, you know, I don't know, mellow or, or, or uh, laid back analysis, but it's just one of those things where the, the shock and the transition um, maybe be like going from middle school to college. That's, that's the difference is like, you're like, yeah. what the fuck? Uh, it was just too, it was so massive for me and um, I didn't know how to handle it. Yeah. What, a, how did your, so you're so young when you get deployed, what, what was your conception of the places you were going before and how did, what, what was surprising about the places when you got there? Man, the, people are people no matter where you go and you have some really cool people and you have some really shitty people. And it doesn't matter if you're deemed a third world country or a first world country, that principle applies across the board. And, you know, you're there to do a job, but again, it's business. It's not personal. I don't personally hate you or your country or your culture. That's not me. I wasn't raised that way, you know? And, and uh, 
and if for some reason we come across somebody or, or some people in that business capacity, fucking sucks to be you. But outside of that, you know, most, most of the time they were great. I mean, there's some really cool people out there that you can learn from in environments that you'd never find yourself. Like I was in an, a, a village in Africa once and these people had never seen like a white guy. And they freaked out. I mean, they freaked out. Mm. And they did this thing where the king of the village came in this like exquisite headscarf to greet us when we walked into the village. And you think about that, middle of nowhere in, in, in a place that I can't even pronounce, not to be funny, but I, I truly can't pronounce it. And I'm and I'm meeting these people and they're they're rolling out the red carpet for strangers that they've never seen before for these white men that they've never seen before, which would be mind blowing just to begin with, but then they're doing it in a way that's so hospitable and so compassionate and they don't even know us. And it's just one of those things where you can't go to Baltimore right now as a stranger and, and walk through a neighborhood and, and get harassed or mm-hmm. uh, we don't, we don't have that here. And it's like, what is, what does this culture know? What does this village know that we're just missing right now? Mm-hmm. And so, and that, again, that's a 40 year old um, retrospect on something that happened to me in my, you know, late twenties. But that's, that's one of those things where there's shitty people everywhere and there's cool people everywhere as well. And hopefully you find more of those cool people than shitty people, no matter where you go. And I think if you do, you're, you're good. Nice. And then, so now, now you're back here and you're working for the Seal Future Foundation. And uh, do you want to get into like kind of the the psychedelic treatments that they're doing, and yeah. maybe into your own experience with psychedelics? Sure. So, uh, Seal Future Foundation wasn't always in the health space, and the reason that we weren't is this is a very much a passion project to include myself. But the co-founders are, are two gentlemen named Brian Martelli and John Wilson, and these two individuals. Um, met in the corporate environment at Goldman Sachs. And no, wait, Brian, forgive me if I fuck that up, but they met somewhere in the journey that was Johnny Wilson's um, transition. So Johnny Wilson was a, was a seal, got out and um, you know, had five kids at the time and got out and, and went to wall street. Now in the teams in the seal teams, that's very much a very, normal path. You'll get out and like, you know, you'll talk to a guy, I see let's get out. He's like, oh, I'm going to go to, I don't know, Yale or Harvard or wherever. Uh, neither of which I did. I'm sure you guys can tell. Uh, and then they went into finance, you know, and it's one of those things where it's, I'm going to, I'm going to be in finance and I'm going to make a shit ton of cash and, and go from there. Johnny took that route. Cause he thought that's what he wanted to do. And he got to Goldman was like, fuck this. Well, I can't say fuck this place. Cause I don't want to tell his story, but fuck this place because it's not it's not what it was, you know, it's not, you know, the team environment, you're not, you know, you know, you don't know, you know, who's got your back and who doesn't, it's just not a good environment for him. And, and I, that's all I'll say, you know, speaking for his story. Mm-hmm. Um, but in that time he transitioned to Goldman, which is a, a huge deal. And then went back into the SEAL teams after he, you know, he had to look at his wife and be like, I'm here now on the pay scale. And now we're going to go here and we have five kids because this is what I love to do. And this is where I feel at home. So it was so bad for him when he transitioned the first time that he went back into that pond that he knew because that's, that's where he's comfortable. Um, and in that time, the Seal Future Foundation was started because he realized that there's nothing else out there that gives the guy the, the blueprint needed for transition. Now, t- to give you an example of how much we don't know and you guys can appreciate this. Like when I transitioned out and I was going on my first interviews, like seals don't wear underwear if for, for anybody's information, like we don't wear really? typically most. Yeah. Guys don't wear underpants. Why? Um, Cause in second phase, when you go through, through diving, you're, uh-huh. you're using a, a, a dive contraption that if they say, if you wear underwear, if you catch on fire, it'll stick to your skin and you'll burn to death. I think that's just oh, because okay. they want to fuck with you, but <laughs> um, typically because of second phase, you don't wear underwear. And yeah, I did that for like 15, 14, 15 years. When I got up and ugly cried, there's a joke running still that I cried, ugly cried with my, my dong out because 
Legend. I didn't know I was crying and I was crying and I just didn't know that my dong was out and it was. Yeah. Um, so going back to your question, it's, it's one of those things where what we don't know is so much. And, and I was going on job interviews, not wearing underwear in my suit. And uh, my wife was like, you got to wear underwear because we can see the mushroom tip. Power yeah. move, dude. I didn't know. Like, I didn't, I didn't, like, but I like, that's so fucking basic, right. but I didn't know. I was in New York city going to an interview, no underpants on sweating through my suit. And I have a big, looks like a piss mark on my suit when I get to the interview, because nobody told me like, you should probably be a little bit more fresher than that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. I, I didn't know. Yeah. Um, maybe that's because I I'm a knucklehead or, or whatever, but you know, that's just a small kind of funny example of like, these guys can execute an operation meticulously down to the second but he can't even go and dress himself properly for an interview like that's mm -hmm. how much the transition sucks um so brian and johnny start the started the foundation we were first focused on just education but then we realized that it wasn't just education there's there's that three-step process into making sure that you're good so you can be the best version yourself for you and then your family and then for anybody that you, you choose to work for, or even if you work for yourself, and if you don't do it in that order, the, the cards don't stack up and you don't have that strong base. Because if I'm struggling internally and I'm telling everybody, my family, my friends that I'm good, and then I'm hopping in the car and going to work, or and then I'm blogging in and, and telling my boss I'm good, I'm fucking lying to myself. Mm. And so we learned some really hard lessons in the beginning of seal future foundation, because we were focusing on getting that guy, the education that they needed from a institutional standpoint. And then what we realized was it has to start from within. You have to have that organic growth and understanding and be able to look at two people or a hundred people in a room and ugly cry and be like, I'm not okay. And I was an extreme case, but at least stand up and say, what I don't know is a lot. Who's willing to help me? And that's where we rely on people within the community, coaches, business mentors that can sit here and say like, this is what being in finance is really like. This is what being an entertainer is really like. This is all these things and having that honest conversation. Now, all that's well and good, but what really happened and what really pivoted us towards the the, the holistic medical space was we started losing guys to suicide. And, and because of that, we realized we were missing the mark. Like, why, why, are, why are our guys killing themselves? And it wasn't at an alarming rate, but one's too many. Mm. And uh, that's when we started focusing on what does the brain look like after the fact? What is the internal being? What does is, what is your soul look like after, you know, pick a number, 10, 15, 20 deployments overseas, and you keep getting dropped back into society and not talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we started creating that culture of being like, JT, you good? And it was like, no, I'm good. But then you really weren't. So then how do you get that layer of accountability? And it's like, mm -hmm. why don't you throw this on your wrist? Or why don't we start seeing, you know, what you're really, what you're really feeling uh, from a biometric standpoint and that's when it became really powerful because at that point we could hold each other accountable because we are all using the same system and they could see that if I was harboring stress or digesting stress in, in, in a wrong way, or if I woke up in a certain state in the wrong way, too many days in a row, I know my phone's going to ring and be like, Hey man, you good? Just like mm -hmm. Jake sent me that text before that 200 and you know, 102 miler. It was like, Hey, you're an idiot, but I love you no matter what. You know, we, we, we created that layer, layer of accountability, but it, even that wasn't enough because you guys can be vulnerable with me and, and I can be vulnerable with you and be like, I'm not okay. I need help. But once you say that, we also have to be able to recommend the modalities that are best suited for every individual that comes into our ecosystem because it's always individualized. Like if I went out with you, Chad, and we went to go surf, I don't know you know, wherever, I don't know, 20 foot waves, I would be shitting myself. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and that would, that stress in me would manifest differently than it would manifest in you, even though we're doing the same exact activity. Now, two years from now, three years from now, if that was the most scared I've ever been, I'm carrying that with me, whether I like it or not. 
even, even, even if I don't think about it for, you know, three or four years. And so my point there is that even though it, you could have been standing shoulder to shoulder with a guy, the, the way that that experience is interpreted is what manifests in you later on to, 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 to either in a good way or a bad way. And that's what we're dealing with on the back end, back end from the health standpoint. So my point to all that is that one size does not fit all when it comes to a recovery modality. Like I said earlier, meditation in an infrared sauna works for me in the morning, but maybe that's cryotherapy and, and, and yoga nidra for you, Chad. Okay. And maybe, maybe it's acupuncture and, and a paleo diet for you, JT. And, and in order to pull that apart, that's where we start at SFF for SEALs. That transition is, what does your blood work look like? Are you okay? We're not going to accept like, yeah, I'm good, bro. We want to hear about the vulnerabilities. We want to hear mm -hmm. about the family. We want to hear about what you're scared about. And now we can have a, conver a conversation around how do we fix that? And that's how the modalities of all the things that we mentioned and eventually leading the nonprofit to understand psychedelics in the way that it does. And before we even like, even talk about psychedelics, like it's not like, Hey, let's go get fucked up and, and, you know, see what we can see. It is very much in a controlled environment and is very much, you know, in the literature now in the scientific literature, you know, it's, it's becoming more widely accepted that something like a psychedelic journey can reset the mind in a positive way. And it can do years of therapy in a matter of moments. And, and maybe some people respond to it, maybe um, they don't. But when you level set with your subconscious after 14 years of combat deployments, you're going to see some shit. Or, and I'm just using me as a personal example because I can't only speak for myself here. Um, you know, truly going to those places is scary, you know, and, and, and using psychedelics in a way that they can be used now is very therapeutic for somebody mm -hmm. like me that struggled with transition and has so much pent up that I, I can't even uh, articulate. And I didn't even know that was there. So for example, <clears throat> uh, during my psychedelic journey, I, uh, at a, at, in a moment during that time frame, went back to when I was a paper boy in New Jersey, when I was uh, 13 years old, I was younger than that. I was about 10 years old. And this 13 year old kid, his first name was Mike. I remember his last name and I'm not going to blow him up on the podcast here. He used to beat me up. He, him and his friends and his crew used to wait for me to drive my bike down the street. And they used to like push me off my bike. They wouldn't do anything bad, but I just knew every day there was going to be some sort of confrontation. I would fight some of these guys and it is what it is. It's not a really big deal. But the point is in, in my mind, as I sit here and tell you guys this story, so much more horrible shit has happened to me in my life. But when I went on to my journey, that's one of those things that came into the front of my mind. And I, I remember releasing tension and just seeing Mike and just being like, it's cool, man. It's good. You know, I'd been harboring that for 20 years, 21 years. And I didn't know. And so it's one of those things where the more that you explore the mind in that level with the right type of medication in the right environment, would you rather have a couple of those moments where you let your mics, you let it go? Or would you rather take a pill, you know, for the rest of your life because you're not ready to let, or you don't know you should let it go, or you just don't know. Uh, it's really all about exploration when you, when you get to that point with, with psychedelics. And I think that's really healthy for my, my type of individual, you know, a veteran population, because taking science out of it, there has to be healing and growth there. And from the, the, the number of veterans that I've talked to, whether you're in a SEAL teams or not, is there has to be purpose in meeting to your life after the fact. Uh, and, and you guys know, you know, I mean, you know, if you guys couldn't be chatting JT anymore and you had to do something different tomorrow, that's scary. Cause your identity is yeah. just got stripped from you. And that's what it's like when you transition out. Hmm. Man. And so with the psychedelics, so is it, do they, uh, do you have sort of professionals guiding you in a way so that you can sort of access that subconscious? Cause it's not just sort of like, 
you know, you take, you take some mushrooms and, right. You know, right. And then it, I, I feel like, uh, they must do, do they, they sort of take you on a journey so that you can really access those parts of your mind. Yeah. It depends on the, it depends. It depends on the treatment and it also depends on, you know, how much work have you put in? You don't just go yeah. and, you know, wake up one week and you're like, I'm going to go into the desert and, and do some peyote or do some ayahuasca or five MEO. At least yeah. you shouldn't. I mean, people have done it that way and that's okay. But, you know, from a veteran population or, or, or a truly holistic standpoint, you have to put in a lot of work before you're ready to go on a journey because there's a lot of stuff that, you know, just like, you know, just like a, a marathon or just like a, any type of traumatic experience that you're going to put pregnancy, anything, you know, you need to prep for it. And it's one of those things where you can't just choose the nuclear five MEO option to reset your brain and not do the prep work. Because if you do it that way, and you don't do the, the post, you know, work, the meditation, the breathing, the writing, you know, what, what am I, all those things, you're, 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 you're not truly grabbing that opportunity. So to answer your question, Chad, yes, a lot of work goes into it and you really, and, and I'm not an expert, like I am no expert. And I will say that out loud. Like I am not an expert on, on, on you know, hallucinogens or, 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 or anything along those lines. Uh, or psychedelics. But what I can tell you, and, and this is just coming from my perspective is I probably prepared tch, fucking 18 months before I physically and mentally was ready to take that journey where there was still a, a, a huge amount of fear, but I was ready to crest and face those fears. And it, and it took me, you know, almost two years. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So you really respect what you're dealing with. <laughs> You have to, I, I mean, and again, there's a difference between taking a little bit of mushrooms and going to see a concert. Like that's not what we're doing here. We're really going internal and going deep uh, and making sure that when you do take that journey, that you're working on something. And when you work on something, it doesn't necessarily have to be, I'm going to work on when I got beat up as a paper boy, when I was, you know, you know, 10 years old, but even being in the right mindset, you guys know the deal. Like, you have to be in the right mindset to be funny. You have to be in the right mindset to, to, to be, you know, a seal. You have to be in the right mindset um, to, to be whatever you want to be that day. And, and that takes time and that takes work. So I take it very seriously. And I took it very seriously because I was scared that if I went on this journey and I was not prepared and I didn't do the work, two things would happen. I'd be one of the only people that had an inverse reaction and I end up dying. Uh, because I wasn't ready in here and, or um, I don't fully take advantage of the opportunity of, of pulling apart, even, even a layer, just a thin layer to get a little more in touch with my subconscious and everything else that lurks there. And I, from my perspective, I can sit here and tell you that I went very deep into my subconscious and I saw things and felt things that, um, were, were like nothing I've ever seen before. And, and in the most mm. beautiful, positive way that I, I can, I can frame that up. Mm. Nice. And so you, no. um, it's like with your family, like if your kid like starts smoking pot or doing something like that, like what's going to be your approach there? Listen, I think, I mean, my kid's five now. And by the time my A kid, years away, probably, probably. You, you know, it'll, it'll probably be legal, but listen, when it comes to, to the kid piece or, you know, I, I'm never going to shield my kid from the shit that I've done. You know, uh, cannabis is one of those things like cannabis can be used. And I know this from the veteran population. And again, I don't care about, you know, I, I don't want to sit here and be like, this is only good for veterans. Cause that's what I'm saying. But if cannabis is used correctly, and I'm a big believer in this, like it will help you sleep and it will help with anxiety. And it will help with a lot of things if you find the right strain and or uh, you're not using it to just numb the pain or, 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 or whatever it may be. So if my kid came home, it smelled like weed. I'd be like, first off, do you have any? Cause we're going to do this and we're going to do it right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we're going to go on that journey together and I'm going to get him blitzed out of his mind. And I'm going to be like, this is what it's like to smoke with your old man. 
and here's what you need to be careful with. And I'm going to do the same thing with alcohol too. Like if we're going to have that night where he sits down, I'm like, here's the tequila. Here's the, the Miller light. Here's all the shit you're probably going to drink. Here's the cigars. Let's, let's get after it kid. Because I would rather him do it with me or with us uh, as a family, get that shit out of the way. So when he's faced with that shit on the street, he can be like, I've been there and I've done that. And if I really want to go drink, I can go drink with my dad and he's got cooler stories than you anyway. So <laughs> whatever, you know? Yeah. And, and he'll trust what you're saying. Cause he'll know you're being like, yeah, yeah. Listen, I know they're going to do that about it. Yeah. yeah. And I don't care. You know, I don't care that you guys drink, but just don't, don't kill anybody. Like don't kill your, like, again, going back to that's something you got to live with for the rest of your life. And you're going to, you're going to have to deal with that. So it's one of those things where, I know you guys are going to do it, but um, do it smart and and know that this is a safe place to do that and experiment and and kind of act like an idiot because I, I don't want to be that parent that picks my kid up in jail after he sideswiped a, a family of you know four that came back from ice cream on a Friday night. Yeah, mm. nice. I really I really admire the uh, that's that's a, like a really integrated way to deal with it because um, I yeah. guess I don't even know why I'm thinking about it. I guess I guess when I have kids, but my parents were the same way. They like raged. And so they would let Did me they? rage. Yeah. And they would let me rage with them. And actually I don't rage that much anymore. I think because they, <laughs> it's almost more rebellion by me now to be like, Hey, I'm just not going to rage. Yeah. Yeah I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I never thought I'd have to think about that, but with technology now and, and all that stuff, like, it's not like I'm not going to know where my kid, like mm-hmm. I'm going to know exactly where my kid is because he's either going to be on the next version of Instagram or whatever the hell the kids are using these days. So it's not going to be able to hide anything from me anyway. So yeah, I'm with you. My parents were big and they're going to regret. They'll probably be like, yeah, really? my parents won't like me categorizing them as ragers. Right. They're not yeah. even mine. <laughs> but let's just say my parents had a full bar in their house when they were ki- like when they were young. I mean, a full fledged, like welcome to Moe's type of bar. And uh, they liked, they liked to party. And that rubbed off on me too. Like I thought drinking was completely fine. I was drinking by the time I was 14 secretly, mm. you know, 13, 14 years old. So yeah, my, I, my my parents don't really rage, but I, they gave me a, a pretty large amount of freedom to where I sort of, I got out of my system, you know, when the time was right. You know, it wasn't like they, I was so, um, I felt so like constrained by like their, their you know, their rules or anything to the point where I, I've seen kids who they don't really let loose until later in life, you know, like yep. late 20s or something when they're sort of should be starting their careers uh it's sort of like when you when you sort of you know uh hold that part down in someone and then it's gonna come out eventually you know yeah 100 percent. Uh, yeah and you it, it, it it's so smart to to just you know teach them how to do it correctly and in the right way and just you know it's like you gotta let the energy out some way and yeah. so, uh, you know, the way, the way you're talking about it is, is just so smart. You, will you do the same thing with your kids? Like, will you be like, Hey, here's the freedom. Cause that's a, that's a yeah. weird question. Cause you, will not, you? if he's too dumb, like if I don't trust that he's smart enough to understand <laughs> the kind of gift that I'm giving him, I'm going to be like, nah, I'm just, we're just, we're, we're going full lockdown on this kid. He's right. not allowed to touch anything, <laughs> but if he seems to have a good head on his shoulders and can, or she and they can kind of see the forest through the trees. I'm like, yeah, we'll have a couple of beers. You can smoke some pot, I guess. But I yeah. don't know. I worry about it. I worry about it. I, I worry about it all the time. Yeah, yeah me too. I, I, I think, because uh, I even with my nes- nieces and nephews, I'm like, you know, how do you even like let them out of your sight? <laughs> like, I just put my head in their, you know. Yeah. Put myself in their shoes. And I'm like, that man, so the anxiety is, is insane. But I think, I think one thing that was effective is I, like I – with my older siblings and my dad and and stuff and my mom, it's like, I just didn't want to disappoint them. And I think that was super effective is there were kind of like, you know, we're, we love you and we're here for you, but you know, we will be disappointed in you. And that was really effective at sort of keeping me at like a certain sort of, you know, keeping me out of trouble. That's interesting. Are your folks still together? No, no, they're divorced. But Um, were they together when you, when you didn't want to disappoint them? No, no. I, I think That's it's even just, more fascinating that even, yeah. even even after the separation, you were like, I just don't want to let my parents down. Yeah, I think because huh. there's both such. You need to good do some people. psychedelics, brother. There, there you go. There's some shit right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, don't know, I had a, you know, I've, I've I've done mushrooms here and there, but I've always right. had to, you know, 
go a little bit deeper. So, and what it's funny though, and, and I don't know what it is uh, in males, but when I uh, when I finished SEAL training, like the day I finished SEAL training, my father pulled me aside in San Diego there and and goes, uh, you know, Bobby, I I didn't think that you were going to graduate college. I said, okay, I did barely, but I did. Mm-hmm. And he goes, but I always knew that you were going to do this and you were going to finish it. And it's like one of those moments of all the things that I've done in my life. Like that's like the super, one of the most proudest moments of my dad kind of giving me that, like that man head nod and being like, you're good. I'm like, yeah, real like, like <laughs> I did it. Like I, I, I got, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I know, I know. You right? know? And, and, yeah. and like, there's something there, man. We're like, that's I, everything. I, I I want to make sure that I make sure I have that moment with my kid where he knows like, you're good. You're like, yeah. and, and it was such a big moment for me. And it's something that I, I mean, I'm telling you guys about it now. And it's one of those things where it, there's something there to that, yeah. that where it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to let you guys down. I just want you guys to be proud of me. Something there. I don't know what it is. Guys, I'm interrupting this podcast to let you know once again, that we are brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped, thank you so much for keeping your, our trims pubed, for looking after our hogs for making sure that our dongs are looking fresh and clean. Because listen up, fellas, 2020 sucked. That's right. It's New Year, new balls with our sponsor, Manscaped. What up? Manscaped is the best men's below-the-waist grooming, offering precision-engineered tools for your family jewels and helping 2 million men all over the world get rid of hair on their balls. Yep, this is a company dedicated to making sure that your balls look pristine. No hair, freaking no pubes. Unless you want some. I mean, with the lawnmower 3.0, you could do whatever kind of pubes you want. I mean, this is the era of pube, uh, pube libre. That means free pubes. What up? If you let yourself go in 2020 while in quarantine, Manscaped is here for you to reboot and stay clean and shaved in 2021. Um, yeah, 2020 was tough for me. Um, I remember in April, the beaches were closed and it felt like I was getting, um, you know, the soul sucked out from my body uh, because I was in my apartment just uh, watching Maury and, uh, um, and, uh, but then I trimmed my pubes and it made it all better. So that's what Manscaped can do for you because they got the skin safe trimmer. It'll reduce nicks to your two best friends at your nuts. We got crop preserver, anti-chafing ball deodorant, moisturizer. Uh, you got freaking the shed travel bag, boxer briefs. Um, and, you know, a guy with hairy balls is like the year 2020. Don't be that guy. So get 20% off plus free shipping with code GoD20 at manscaped.com. 20% off plus free shipping with the code GoD20 at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. Happy New Year to your nuts. And Merry Christmas. What up? Uh, okay. And we are also brought to you by the legends. And I can't stress this enough. Legends at BetterHelp. What up, guys? I mean, we talk about mental health on this podcast all the time. Your mental health is important. And it's important to stay up on it. You know, keep yourself stoked. Make sure your stoke is peaking make sure you are frothing at all levels and if you're not that's okay because better help can come in and help you fill your stoke tank back up because they have licensed professionals um that will you know assess your needs match you with your own licensed professional therapist uh and then you can regain your stoke they'll connect you in a safe private online environment super convenient you can start communicating in under 24 hours it's not self-help. It's professional counseling. This is the real deal, guys. And they do it on Zoom. They do it electronically. And so it's perfect for this year. Um, you can send a message to your counselor anytime. You can get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone session. BetterHelp <clears throat> is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. Um, more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Financial aid is available. Uh, the service is available for clients worldwide. And these guys will specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, all kinds of trauma. Um, anything you share is confidential. It's convenient, professional, affordable. 
and uh, they got testimonials. So you can check it out for yourself, see what people have to say. They're legit. Better help. You guys are absolute legends. Um, and I've gone to therapy and it's just fantastic. I mean, one time I went to therapy and I was so pumped afterwards after just, you know, getting my mental health in check that I just pumped Eric Prids all, all the way home. And that's just like, you know, heavy techno, just blasting because I was so pumped up. So if you want to do the same um, and start living a happier life today, you can get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash go deep. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash go deep. All right, back to the show. But like I heard him talking in an interview once and he would do his bit and his routines inside of old people homes when he was trying to prep for a special. Mm. And he knew if he could make those old people laugh, then he knew that he had like the, the set was pretty close to being ready for like HBO. Oh, right. So like having the ability to go in and making like people in like a town hall laugh about not partying. <laughs> <laughs> it's so simple, but it takes a lot of thought. So like, is that just natural? You're like, we're going to completely fuck with these people and, and just, like, is that planned out or not? Not yeah. I know it's planned that planned out in a way, but I mean, that that's deep. That like, that's deep shit. Like you're making people laugh that, um, you know, you're not just one demographic. I mean, obviously your following is, but you're still able to make, you know, those old people laugh as well. And I think it, a lot of um, our biggest things have, have come from a place where it's like, like, I don't know if you've seen the Paul Walker statue speech. We want like a Paul Walker set. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. you know, people are like, Oh, is that a joke? Do you just not, you know, are you just making fun of, and I'm like, no, no, I'm a huge Paul Walker right. fan. Like and I, it was I, I, really I articulate him. and well-stated, but that's, that's <laughs> where I was like, huh. And yeah. that's where there's a lot of thought. There. I mean, listen, you don't just get on the mics and you're like, Hey, what's up everybody. And keep people entertained. Like there's a lot of work yeah. that goes into them, you know? Oh, For sure. Thank you. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, I think coming from the heart is 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 key. Uh, and that's why I said earlier, JT, like, you know, don't, like, you know, I could say the same thing to you in the sense, like, you seem exceptional at that. And it's one of those things where you're like, hey, don't mistake, you know, something that somebody would construe as like exceptional for like just true straight passion. Like, I truly am passionate about psychedelics or whatever. Like, you're really right. good at making people laugh. And that's a fucking oh, gift. You. You know oh, what I mean? You. Like you guys have yeah. that gift. And um, when I see somebody that's good at their craft, I'm always like, all right, let me ask you some questions before <laughs> you kicked me off the show. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate the interest for sure. Yeah. Oh, it's it cool, man. A- it's good to see you guys do some funny shit. And uh, oh, thanks, man. Yeah, it's, it's well thought out. And I think it's really articulated well. And then when you're, you're seeing those old people laugh, I'm like, they got it. It's, oh, it's thanks, man. Oh, thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. That's really motivating. You, you get me fired keep, up. Keep too. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah more of that especially now <laughs> yeah you know? um yeah thank you uh do you want to yeah, answer man. some do you want to answer some listeners questions sure sure i right. <laughs> i think i think i think you'll be exceptional at this um here we go first uh qu- they're a little long sometimes this is a question from marcos First off, love you guys. I'm a high school senior and I've been doing a lot of self-reflection for college apps. And I realize you guys have left a huge positive impact on my attitude towards life. So thank you. Anyways, I'm writing today about my girlfriend. She's absolutely the best. And I had a crush on her since middle school and we finally started dating junior year. Let's go. I'm not the type of guy who likes to think about relationships in the long term, especially with the age I'm at now. But my girlfriend has recently brought up merging our college plans. She talks about distances between colleges we are applying to and what direct flights there are. This caught me super off guard because I just always assume we'd be on the same page of loving each other uh, up for the rest of high school and then parting ways for college. As previous guest Honors Holmes said, let's put a pin in things. And if we come back together, we do. And if we don't, we don't. I think if she's really the one we'd end up together, but I don't want to have a relationship possibly corrupted by long distance. So my question is, how should I navigate around her planning our future together? Should I tell her how I'm feeling head on? Do I tell her now? I could be ruining a potential senior year of enjoying each other's company. But if I don't tell her now, am I leading her on and being unfair? Any advice is greatly appreciated, bros. What do you guys think? Um, I think... I think I could see it going both ways. I could see you telling her now, but I could also see you waiting. I don't know if you're necessarily 
leading her on. I think there's maybe a gentle way to tell her would be like, Hey baby, I really got to just focus on what's the best college for me. And then of course I want to be able to see you, but, but that's got to be secondary. Or does he want to break up? He wants to break up. Right. I think so, man. Like just think about up. it. If he knows he's not going to go into college with this girl, you might as well cut her away now and have fun senior year. Mm-hmm. Smart. Yeah. yeah. yeah but because here's up. the thing, if you know, it's going to end senior year, cause you're going to go and, focus on college for you. And we all know what that means. Like, come on, man. Like, yeah, you love this girl, but again, like, uh, like whoever said, I don't, I, I missed who you were talking about, but if you guys link back up, you're only a, a DM away from, you know, from linking back up to her with her four years from now. And she's going to be more experienced. That'll be nice. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I, I think it's uh I think it's understandable. I mean you can just base you know, you can say like look, like you know we can if we if we if we made plans to go to college together and it didn't work out, we can that that leads to a ton of resentment. I mean I think it's a very you know, your your thought process process on this is very understandable. So I don't you know, I think um I think you know what you that, want to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean that I might that I think- you're young, man. You're so young and you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. I think, you know? I think maybe tell her like, Hey, this is over once we go to college, but then tell her that now. <laughs> and then maybe you live it up in the period until then. And it all has this kind of doomed romantic uh, heightening to it because you're like, we know this isn't forever. And we know we're going to have to the, go the tragic later. ending. Yeah. They can break up on the yeah. 50 yard line in the high school. Like, yeah, like yeah. graduation. Super passionate kiss. He wrote her a big letter with like some Snow Patrol lyrics, and totally, then, uh, or whoever the band is these days. And it's Nickelback. Just, yeah. You know? Oh hell yeah. And you say goodbye, and you cry on your way home, but you know it's the right thing to do. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Done. So that, that 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 fires me up. It, it, if she was agreeable to to that scenario of like this is gonna end at senior year, <laughs> that would be uh, that would be epic. Oh yeah, it would be. Um. What up, Stoke Odds? Love the pod. I've been single for quite some time now. The QT was a total boner killer because I was being socially distanced and single. <laughs> Lately, I started seeing this new girl from Tinder. We spent the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday together. Caught Z's all three nights. She's pretty chill. Here's the problem, bros. We have been having sex the last three days. I've only busted my load once. There's nothing wrong with her. She's cute. Not like a 10, but certainly good looking. She told me I have a big hog. Nice. But have been having... <laughs> he, wrote, he wrote nice. But have been, been having a problem busting my load. I feel like a total renob. She is fairly boring in the sheets. Now that I haven't, not that, now that I haven't schloated every time, she thinks there's something wrong with me, with her, but it's all me. I told her that it's nothing wrong with her and now she doesn't believe me. I'd like to keep hanging with her, but I think sexually we would not be very compatible. Should I cut my losses before it gets too deep, pun, or feel it out and just try to spice things up in the bedroom? I think my QT drought and how hard it is to, make, to meet other people makes me lean towards the lather. It's ladder, but I also don't want to lead her on. Any advice is appreciated. Love you, Stoke Lords. Age 27. I don't know if that changes y'all's opinion. Hell yeah, it does. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, listen, you're 27 years old and you're and you're not you're not finishing. Whether you're telling yourself that you're that, that she's good or not good or just average, you just there's listen, there's thousands of fish in the sea that are tens for you and your hog. Go find a 10 and, and get off every single time. You're 27. You're not like you're 19. Yeah. right am i am i crazy here no i like I, it yeah i i think i, I think you're right I, oh go ahead jt no you go you go dog uh i i think i'm just guessing here i just because he was in corn he's in teen. i'm gonna guess that he was watching a ton of porn and he may be oh, just desensitized that's a good point, Chad. that's a good yeah. that's another variable that I, yeah yeah i'd ask and, him how how often is he spanking it that's yeah he he impaired his hog by you know just cranking it too much and i think he, it's gonna take a little you're gonna it's gonna take some uh you know you're gonna have to keep pushing to flip that tire and, and get your hog to where it's at but J, yeah jt what what do you think dude i think i think i think you give it a couple more go rounds things don't always work perfect at the beginning when i start a new relationship i can't get a boner for like a while because i feel so vulnerable but then once i get over that hump, really yeah, the sex is actually even if she's like you know you're like unicorn status. Nothing to do with the nothing. 
it just has to do with how much I like the woman. And if I really, really like them, I kind of need them to accept me as a, as a non-boner having entity before I can get a boner. <laughs> and then I get super, I'm horny. How long, does that, how long does the non-boner entity last for? Dude, the first relationship I was in, because I was a 24-year-old virgin, it took me months. But wow, um, yeah, but it's huh. but then, but then I'm like, I'm not even trying to like overcorrect, but I'm a horny guy, but I just, it takes me a while to find my rhythm with someone. So I don't know, dude, I think be honest with her, try some different things. And then, yeah, it's not her, but it's all not you either. You guys are still figuring out each other. So, I mean, if you're not, Man, you guys are so nice. I'm like, fucking cut her away. And you're like, well, it's probably spanking it too much. And you're like, well, sometimes I can't get it up. And I'm like, fuck her. I, so I, I would probably side with you guys more than, than my jaded old man self. No, I, I, we, we always, that's usually the case. Like we, we, we'll have a guest and he's much more of a realist. And it's always good to have that perspective in there because we're wow. kind of like, yeah, you know. What's up, dude? Strider Jonas, huge hogger fire guest. I wrote in a couple months ago about my best friend who used to drop dong. That just means pull his dick out, but stop and wanted to know what to say. The squad was fired when he, the squad was fired when you boys talked about it. Episode 138. Well, boys, he's back. We had a small gathering outside and everyone was tested and he dropped dong. I've never seen the stoke level that high. Probably never will. So thank you for the advice and making the fire. I have a small dong t-shirt. Thank you for making me confident in my truth. P.S. I wanted to add a movie required listening. That would be the Oren Ishii versus the bride fight. Oh, but he wanted to say that to Strider. Uh, so basically, we, we, I think we gave the green light to this dude to uh, pull his dong out when he's partying with his bros. And, and, um, but he, but he, he self admits that he's got a small dong. Yeah, that's a big part of our uh, culture here is that we celebrate small dicks mm. and we have them. So I would say that the pulling your dong out in front of your boys uh, is always memorable and 100% encouraged. Nothing could go, and as long as you're not doing it towards a, a you know, in an inappropriate way towards somebody else, mm-hmm. yeah. say let it. Why not? I you love know? this. I love that, that. dude. I, I remember one time our buddy Pete, jacked hockey player, helicoptered his dong in front of all of us. One of the best moments of high school. Yeah, I mean, we paid a guy in high school. His name was Dustin, and he was uncircumcised, and all of us were circumcised. And we paid him $150 to pull his dong out so we could just see the the, the anteater instead of the mushroom tip. Nice. Yeah. What a lucky guy like, to be. You know, but you don't forget too. that. Like, you're like, I'm going to pay you money because I, I don't have one. Pull it out, man. Dude, dude, we saw a photo today of Kurt Russell hanging dong. And it was uh, <laughs> super memorable. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. He's got good tan lines, too. There you go. As long as he's got a good tan line. Um. All right, last question. What up, dudes? I hope you are finding ways to stay tan in the season shift. I write to you in some eager times of despair as I bring terrible news. I have just gained knowledge that my buddy who's been one of my best friends for a year now has been secretly hitting up and hanging out with my ex of a recent breakup, even though he knows we still hook up and hang with each other from, and he's mm. from time to time. While we were dating, he always called her one of his best girlfriends and I put everything he said or did off to that reason but shit just got serious so i'm asking for advice on how to approach my friend with this information i don't want to ruin the friendship but obviously i can't trust him thanks chad jt aaron and a possible dank guest man what this is a tough one sorry man i say make the relationship stronger talk to your boy first see if he's down with the three-way mm. oh nice nice because Dude. Listen, if she's down with both of you in some capacity, you might as well have that experience together. All three of you, maybe take some mushrooms, maybe don't. It's up to you guys. Uh, I'm not a doctor, so don't do that. I just realized what I said. Uh, but why not? Why not? Why not make it fun? Why not? If she's into rather, both of you. What, but wouldn't you rather have a three-way with a bro, like with one of your other bros who's more loyal to, to looking out for you? That would be my only addendum is – because this yeah, works. sure. But I don't know if I can when you have the perfect three, storm, it only comes up a couple times in a lifetime, and you got to take advantage of the perfect storm, you know. And 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 what's the word? He already they already broke up. He knows that he's not the right person, or she he knows that she's not the right person, and now his his boy's going to figure that out probably too. Why not take advantage of the situation? I'm trying to be positive, guy. Right? I think it's very yeah. positive. Yeah, I think you're finding a. Uh, uh, a utilitarian solution where everyone kind of everybody's happy yeah you know i love it 
do you do you think can you to can you be best friends with a dude if you've never been in a threesome with him 100 percent, yes but you can also be best friends with a dude that you've been in a threesome with why not that's a very smart answer yeah it, it you shouldn't know? be binary yeah no sure. it i mean just because there's plenty of dudes in the seal teams that i didn't have a threesome with not that i've never had one but if i did and they're, they're still my brothers you know yeah yeah you know, something chad and i wrestle with we're like are we best bros if we've never been in a threesome together and but it's nice to hear you say that yeah, yeah. i mean eventually it'll happen if the perfect storm shows up you know that's that's really reassuring uh and and yeah <laughs> so, I think so let me that, let me ask you guys this let me ask you guys this yeah if you guys had the perfect opportunity to have a threesome with the two of you and dream girl whoever would you do it oh yeah yeah for sure would you talk about it on the on, on the podcast for sure if, yeah if, if she was down for it i mean we'd have to get the okay from her to and you know to take to take the experience public but I, yeah. I, yeah, I would love I would love to see Chad and Flagrante and and feeling joy and and giving joy, while I just you know, uh, drill myself. <laughs> would you? Uh, I mean, dare to dream. You got, the opportunities never happen. No, we're both in relationships. Yeah. Oh, all right. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. But I, yeah. I, I mean, there's nothing I'd love to see more than. You know, uh, or just to be in the heat of the moment and to look over and see J- <laughs> to see J- JT drilling himself. <laughs> Thanks, dude. I I, I think that'd be, really, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Yeah, I think that's but a special I, dude, moment in the relationship, though. Yeah, and then to you know, we're roll roll reverse. You know, it's like next night I drill myself to JT just you know because right. like I always hear about his dirty talk and I'd like to see it in person in in, in, in action. You're like shit's gonna get weird. Don't. It's all patented too, so you can't steal yeah. my. Sh- but yeah, here we go. To, to see if I could drill myself to that. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I'm a yeah. I'm a big dirty talker. Um. So I'd love I'd love for Chad because Chad's such a good writer too. I'd love to get feedback on my dirty talk as I go. Like, hey, maybe just maybe just one fuck. Right. Tone it down a bit or, or bring it up a notch. You know, let's get real yeah. dirty. Or you know, more okay. adjectives. Okay. Maybe instead of yeah. fuck, maybe a shit. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Well, I think I, I'd have a good point of view of like, you know, how his dirty talk is coming across. You know, it's like, if you right. want to bring this more into the public realm, you know, this, right. this is sort of how you, you know, it's like, is this really, do you want to be this guy or do it this guy? You know, it's like, oh, I really liked when you hit that really key emotional note on your, on your orgasm. You know, it's like, you really sort of drove it home. Like I am coming, you know what I mean? Thank you, dude. Announcing, you know, this is this is happening. Yeah. Well, Robert, I think that's a good place to end. Uh, 100%. Right. There's no really, reco- there's really no recovering after that. <laughs> yeah. We we took it to a weird place, and I'm I'm grateful totally. for going there with us. And also, just uh, it was just so nice talking to you, man. It was really uh, so great, enlightening. Appreciate and, that, guys. And I yeah, do. it was just super meaningful for me. So thank you for coming on and and doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, you know, and and if anybody and can I give a shameless plug for the nonprofit? Yeah, everyone. Oh, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, plug away. All right. Hey guys, if you guys got value out of this or you're gonna want to check out, you know, more of what we're doing at Seal Future Foundation, please go to sealff.org. That's sealff.org. You can find me there. You can find the rest of the organization, the people that lead that organization. And listen, on that, if you if you guys have veterans that that may be struggling or 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 anything along those lines, you know, have them come there. And yeah, it is, it is, it isn't a nonprofit to help transitioning seals, but we're never going to turn an, a blind eye to a brother or sister that have, that is, that needs help. And we'll, if we can't help them, we will figure out who can and um, make sure that they get the help they need to the best of our ability. So I uh, appreciate you guys having me on in all seriousness. I hope you guys got value out of it. And um yeah, check out sealff.org if, if you guys want to learn more about the nonprofit and that's Seal Future Foundation. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much, man. Thanks, Rob. It was so great talking right, to you. I mean, it was, it was so Yeah, good. man. Yeah. We should uh we should do it again whenever. And and uh when I'm out in San Diego, I'll let you guys know or when I'm out in LA. Um for sure. Because uh, I'd love to ha- sit down and and, and uh grab coffee or whatever if you guys are. Oh, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. I'll, yeah. I'll have yeah. an ice bath ready for you, ready to totally. go. Thanks, Rob. Nice. All right, guys. Have a good night. Have a great one. See you guys. Bye. Bye.
That was awesome. Dude, that was so fun. Like I would gladly take on a respiratory illness for you. You know what? When I, uh, when I was getting my test for Thanksgiving, I was kind of hoping I had it. Right. Because I, was, I just want to get it over with. I'm not like, I'm just like, because then I'd be able to like, I'd get over it and then I could travel and see my family. Yeah. That was my thought. Well, that's really nice. Yeah, thanks. I don't know. Soon enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did that sound like I meant you were going to get it? Yeah. No, I didn't mean it like that. Oh, I no, I meant I, you see him. I, yeah. no, I, I didn't, I didn't okay. interpret it that way. Okay, good, That's good, good. Yeah. No, no, I meant like he'll see him soon enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should we start? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, yeah, I'm rolling. Oh, so I got to start it. Yeah. My dog, Chad. Good to be in the studio with you. Yeah. After we had that lovely conversation. Robert's the best. Yeah. I love him. I love him too. Yeah. An inspiring man. Yeah. I want to do an ice bath with him. Every morning. That's nice, dude. Thanks. I'm sure you'd be down for that, too. Oh, thanks, man. So, what's your beef of the week? Uh, my beef of the week is with this little Grom at Manhattan Beach named Griffin. Um, he's just, you know, he's just been flexing on me out in the water a lot. And, uh, you know... I know I, you know, I, I, I look young. He probably think, you know, this kid's probably like 14. He probably thinks I'm, you know, a college kid. And he's just trying to, you know, flex on me. He brings out his little squad out there and they all paddle out and just paddle around me and, you know, chirp me a little bit when they get good waves. And um, it's just kind of getting on my nerves. So I just thought I'd call out Griffin on the podcast and just say, you know, um, you can go fuck yourself. Yeah. Man. Have they, have, has he uh, specified at all why he's picking on you? Uh, I don't know. He's he's he said because my like he's like he's like you have an orange on your rip curl suit. He's like, what are you doing? And I think he has like you know there's like this old time beef with like like pros who wear like neon wetsuits and stuff like only pros can wear that and I think he thinks that I'm trying to flex because I have a little bit of orange on my wetsuit and he's just trying to put me in my place and I think he probably has like a you know domineering father who you know is puts him in his place so he's taking it out on me and uh you know and he's also groms tend to move in in packs you know so they just they just whenever I go out on at 32nd street they you know oftentimes they were out there this morning and just paddling around me and making it really difficult for me to get waves. And I bonded with this guy, actually, uh, Ron. What up, Ron? Um, who he's been living in Manhattan Beach for like 35 years. And he's like, these fucking groms, man. You know, just taking all the waves. I've been living here for 35 years. And then he, he took a wave and, and, one, and one of uh, Griffin's buddies snaked him. And, uh, and, he, and I'm like, do you go on that? And he's like, yeah, I went. I've been living here for 35 fucking years. I went on that wave. I hate these groms and I'm like me too that's inspiring yeah so and I hear what you're saying about the father to him stuff to you like shit kind of rolls downhill that way yeah, yeah and I think it's just I don't know what it is with like extreme sports and little kids and me um just always clowning on me um yeah because you got picked on at the skate park yeah I'm getting picked on here it's a pattern but I wouldn't uh read too much into that because because then you'll start to blame yourself like there's something uh kind of uh faulty in you and that's why these kids are picking on you i think yeah. you've just had a bad string of luck and you've run into some really nasty uh junior high kids yeah yeah when you go to the when you go to park at the beach and you see them out in the break yeah do you ever not go in the water yeah you'll turn around yeah you know it's it's kind of like that moment in Step Brothers where i'm like They'll probably make me lick white dog shit. Um, but yeah. this isn't, you know, it, maybe it's like... Has it gotten physical? No. Um, Are you worried about it getting physical? Uh, no. You I think, think you could kick his ass. Oh, I could beat the fuck out of him, yeah. Yeah. I, I could stomp that little fucking dweeb. I don't know if you got that kind of if you if you know you can beat his ass, I think you can out shit talk him too, right? Yeah, probably. But that's not you don't want to shit talk. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think uh, maybe a part of me just likes getting dominated. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. And you think he can see that in you, that you want to get dominated? Yeah. Interesting. I've thought about that about myself, too. Yeah. I'm kind of a cuck, but a cuck when it comes to Groms making fun of me. But I'm not even, like, he's not even making fun of my skill level. Because I think, I, you know, I'm, I'm probably even better than Griffin. I think he's just flexing on me because I'm, like, out solo with, like, a partly orange wetsuit. And he's just, you know, he's like... He's like, you're not allowed to have that much steez. And a part of me is like, yeah, tell me, tell me what's up. Because you're comfortable in your skin, too, and he's not. Yeah. And so he doesn't like the fact that you can be the way he can't be. Yeah. But what he wants to be. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. He's a little fucker, that kid. Yeah. You know, he's a little piece of shit bitch. Yeah, he's a And fucking... I, I hate him, too. Yeah. Because um, you shouldn't be mean to anyone. Yeah. And, the, the you know, the ocean's big, so if you don't like the person you're next to, paddle elsewhere, bro. Mm-hmm. I um. Thanks, man. Yeah, of that, that means a lot that you have my back. And if I ever do decide to throw down with him, um, you know, I mean, he is like fourteen, fifteen. So. I'll, I'll 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 punch any fourteen year old. Good. Not any fourteen year old, but I will punch any fourteen year old that you need me to punch. Thanks, dude. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, there's I have a lot of Groms on my list. Yeah. Yeah, I think too with like what you were saying about how like you get picked on by uh, preteens a lot, or is are they preteens? Yeah, I think so. Pre- yeah, technically there. they're they're almost teens, but I think adults don't see in you what these preteens are seeing. It's mm-hmm. kind of like a Polar Express thing where only these preteens can hear the whistle of of your vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. Of like I want to be I want to be dominated, but I don't. Or, or is that what you're saying? Yeah, or like whatever it is. Like I don't think I don't think any adult man who sees you is like oh I want to pick on this dude but for mm-hmm. some reason like thirteen year olds they see something in you that's like at that age is what needs to be picked on yeah they see me and they're like this is a little shit bitch no I mean I don't know uh, is that gonna be going the whole time oh sorry I forgot to uh, I'm sorry put her on an airplane <laughs> no I don't think you're a little shit bitch I wouldn't use those words sorry it's okay. I, 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 no, I, I hear you. I, I, I mean, dude, I feel like a little shit bitch. Totally. But I don't think we can let these 14 year olds take our power like that. Yeah. I asked my dad if he was like, if he got clowned on by Groms as a, as a, you know, as a, as a 20 something, um, moving into 30. You, you are 30. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, he said no. Nice. So. Well, at least it's nothing genetic. Yeah, and that's my mom, and she's like, what are Groms? So. That's a good burn. Yeah. Yeah, maybe she was just trying to burn this Griffin dude, and I wasn't even aware. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's looking out for you. Yeah. Well. She, she's just trying to, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was go ahead. That's my beef. Yeah, it's a good beef, man. I'm Thanks. sorry. Uh, I'm sorry you're going through that. I hope. I hope you know, the good thing is, is these 14 year olds will grow up. Yeah, and they're not going to keep picking on you for more than a couple more years. I hope. I, I'm sure of it because yeah. they're going to go to college. Yeah, if they go to LMU, <laughs> then you're in trouble. I'll have then a it's whole not just, just clowning on me. Then it's not just winter breaks and spring breaks. It's it's yeah. year round. Yeah. Well, if they're good baseball players, they should go to UCI and play for my friend Danny Baboni. He's the baseball coach there. Yeah, and he could just pound on them. And he'll make them run. He makes his guys run a lot. Nice. They come in out of shape. These get, these young buckaroos don't like to run. Yeah. So he'll make them run, and that'll that'll beat the, the badness out of them. That's good stuff. They should call it UC Newport Beach because it's right there. Aaron, wh- who's your beef of the week? My beef of the week is with the HBO program, The Undoing. Ooh. Now, I'm not going to spoil anything. I might as well, but I'm not going to. But what my beef is, is with how many English actors they cast in it. It takes place in New York, and their accents are not good. The the English is coming out. There's a lawyer, every court scene, you hear it. Nicole Kidman, her character could have been Australian. Just let her be. It's it's weird. Uh, Yeah. That's my beef. And, and and Hugh Grant is playing an Englishman, of course, because 
when has he ever played an American? And I don't think he can. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. But he's great. He's great in it. I'll give that to Hugh Grant. He's amazing in it. He's awesome. Yeah. I, 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 I think any actor who has a bad accent in a movie, I really have an issue with because you get multiple takes. Like you can, you get ten tries, and and then in the final movie, it's a bad accent. I'm like, you didn't have one take where you effectively use the accent. Yeah, well, that's a, Nicole Kidman. I think she's amazing, one of the best. But I, I even in like Big Little Lies, I could hear her the Australian accent come through sometimes. Yeah, and when England people do a, an American accent, they they make it. It sounds like vaguely American, but it's from like a town I've never been to before. Right, right, yeah, yeah. It's like somewhere in Pennsylvania is the accent, but yeah. I've never been there. Yeah. In in the Undoing, it's almost as like, are you haunting this show? She <laughs> kind of talks like a ghost. But <laughs> interesting. But yeah, uh, it's, I I can just pick out when an, an English person's playing an American. Now it's uh, pretty crazy. And we'll catch up on the undoing so you can fully beef it. Yeah, I, I would like to. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call uh, my brother for my beef of the week because I'm, I'm giving my beef to, to my brother and, by extension, the Moan Boys. The Moan Boys is a group that uh, Strider titled that. He titled them the Moan Boys. They're uh, in our fantasy football league. I'm, my brother and I co-manage our team together. And Strider basically said that they were doing some unfair rules. They were using unfair rules to keep him from playing, from not playing a defense at a strategy because they were forcing him to do a full lineup because of some arbitrary rule. And then he wasn't going to pay the fine. And he said they were all a bunch of assholes. So this is, I, I wanted to, but they got mad at me and were like, hey, the, the podcast was one sided. This is bullshit. So I'm going to call my brother and have him say his side. I've given him no warning that this is happening. What up? What up, dude? Dude, that was a solid what up. Um, <sighs> you're on the pod, and I've brought you on for a specific reason. I was hoping that you could address your side of the Strider fantasy football uh, debacle. I'm calling it a debacle. And <laughs> and and just uh, give voice to, to the Moan Boys. Uh, yeah, happy to. Thanks for, uh, thanks for calling me. Uh, so Strider, Strider's upset that we have a rule that's been in place because people have wanted to play a defense while they were on a bye because they're scared of negative points. We've already legislated this before. It's been dealt with. We can obviously change it, but we would need to vote on it and it would take place next year. But Strider's being lame about it. And just saying, no, I don't want to pay. And then he came up with a really good nickname for the three of us, the Moan Boys, which I do have to give him credit because it's really funny um, and definitely disempowers us when we try and come back at him. But, uh, but I'm just annoyed that he just decided that it didn't suit him. And he's just like, no, I'm not going to follow it. And he says he's not going to pay up. And, you know, and then he went on the pod and said that we have no integrity, which is hurtful. Uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah, you don't like it when you're integrity. I mean, no one does, but, but that's a, that's a big shot. Yeah. It stings. And you know, he's, he's normally a great guy. I would always joke that he was a piece of shit because you know, that's ridiculous. He's, he's a, he's a great person, but he's been pissing me off. And I think next time I see him, I'm just going to wrestle him until he cries. Nice. And I'm guessing that'll take like, I'll probably already be crying when we start. And I imagine it'll take about 45 minutes of just wrestling nonstop. And just, I really, cause I don't, you know, I'm not going to fight him, you know, but he's pissing me off. Uh, what what is the uh, uh, the rule again? Just to clarify, it was just you have to start a defense. You're not allowed to start a defense on by. You're not allowed to leave the spot alone. I think the bigger problem is that people don't like defenses, and maybe we should just vote on whether or not to get rid of them. But then that's a slippery slope with kickers, and I don't know. Some people. That's what I think the bigger problem is. But like, you should have to fill out every roster spot. And at the very least, if we don't want to do that, we can vote on it. 
but it's already a rule coming into the season, and we're not going to change it week 10 or whatever it was just because Strider was, you know, worried about it. And so he just he didn't want to f- start a defense in this week, mm-hmm. and because he did that, he was supposed to pay a fine, and he doesn't want yeah. to. Yeah, and he mm-hmm. had options. And as he mentioned, every single one of his options that he chose not to go with scored positive points. So the the plan didn't. His strategy was actually uh, ineffective. Mm. So the defense that he already had on his roster scored. It was I think it was only one point, so not a lot. And then the other four that he could have picked up also scored positive points. If if Strider doesn't pay the fine, he's got to go. Those are the rules. He's out of the league. Yeah, and that'll hurt. But I think it'll hurt him more, and it's all his own doing. You got to protect the integrity of the league. I'll yeah. I'll vote. I, I'm I'm. I would. I think I'll vote to keep him in the league and to, or to come up with some middle ground punishment. Like maybe we just force him to forfeit like the first two games of next year or something like that. Is there is there space for for an in between uh, punishment? <laughs> Not at the moment. You know, it's I, I can't I don't wanna open the door to that. He's because based based on based on the way that he's reacted to this whole thing, I'll take advantage. Well, you know, hearing you talk about it sounds reasonable on your side too. Very reasonable. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You know. I don't know why and he didn't he didn't call me out by name, but still, it is still hurtful. And totally unnecessary. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll let you go, Chris. I love you. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, giving your side of things, and, and you did it with great yeah, dignity. I appreciate the platform, and uh, you know, I hope that he listens to this and understands where we're coming from, and sees the light, and stops being a total idiot about it. Because he is a smart guy, so he shouldn't act dumb. <laughs> All right, love you, man. Well said. Love you too. Say, hi, you say hi to Zoe. Say hi to yeah. Say hi to Becca and Zoe for me. What up? What up, Becca? What up, Becca? <laughs> Later, guys. Later, Later, dude. You know, it sounds like. I mean, I, I I still don't really get what's going on, just because I don't play fantasy. So I'm like, start a defense. What the hell are you guys talking about? <laughs> but it sounds like, from his side of things, Strider just doesn't want to adhere follow the rule. Right, I think that's what they're saying, and he just doesn't want to do something because it would it would negatively impact his team. Right, and I think I think Strider does genuinely believe that it's a bad rule, and I agree with him. But the rule was in place, mm-hmm. and he and he was made aware of it, and he just decided to break the rule anyways. Yeah, according to all these guys, but I actually do agree with him on that. I'm trying to be impartial, but but yeah. it's hard. Yeah, no, it's a. Uh... It's, it's, it's a tough one. It's tough. But we'll we'll figure it out. My other beef of the week is with people who say they have synesthesia, where they can, like, hear colors or taste <laughs> words. I believe none of you. <laughs> I think one, maybe one, like, Mozart had synesthesia. Everybody else is just faking it. They're just pretty creative. Pharrell and, and uh, Maggie Rogers, my, my legends and babes from last week, He's like, I'm synesthesia. And she's like, I am too. <laughs> no, she says, he's like, he's like, I'm really interested to see your visual. She's like, yeah, well, I'm synesthesia. He's like, interesting. Yeah, me too. Kind of like threatened by it. I'm like, neither of you guys are synesthesia. Just, yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. I got synesthesia too. All right, Chad, who's your babe of the week? My babe of the week is uh, Felicity Palmatier, the star of the new, oh, crap. The star of the new nude surf flick. It's nude? It's nude. Whoa. Um, what's it called? It's called Skin Deep. And uh, I rented it today for $3. And I was a little bit bummed to find out that it's only four and a half minutes long because I was really stoked to watch like a 45-minute nude surf flick. And it's just uh, Felicity Palmatier is um she is the star of it and she's basically just embracing embracing who she is embracing her femininity embracing her body embracing her truth and just going for a nice nude surf 
and I'm like, wow, this, what a beautiful film. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was just really enjoyable to watch. And I just really commend her for embracing <laughs> her truth. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I didn't mean to laugh there. I, 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 I thought it was a great flick. And it was just her surfing nude. And I was like, that's freedom. That's nice. That's something we all need to see right now, especially with all this lockdown stuff. You know, it helps to just watch someone just riding a wave nude um, because that just reminded me that, you know, I'm having a good time, but even better times are coming. Nudity built around adrenaline-based activities mm. is always um, liberating yeah. and, and inspiring. Right. You see someone naked on a dirt bike, on a surfboard, mm. on a thoroughbred horse. Yeah. You get fired up. It's like that's being in touch with nature. It's that, pr it's primal. Yeah, that's what Pachamama wants. And it's vulnerable. Yeah, because you could your your Willy Whacker could get schwacked. Yeah, and she looks good too. Tally Whacker, that's what I meant to say. And she looks good too. And I'm not gonna lie to the audience right now and say that I didn't rent it at first because I was kind of horny. That is part of the reason why I watched why I rented it. And then I watched it and I'm like. Oh, nice. You know, like I really actually got something out of that. Like it's, it wasn't just my, uh, I wasn't just indulging in my, in, in, you know, the, the temptations of the flesh. Hey, sometimes it takes a leaky bucket, you yeah. know? I mean, I watched Starship Troopers cause I wanted to see nudity mm -hmm. and then I ended up being really taken by it's like uh, commentary on fascism and stuff like that mm. and on, on how we misinterpret our enemies. So totally, I, uh, I don't know, horniness, as long as it gets you to uh if it leads to inspiration i'm all for it oh yeah. for sure and, and if it just leads to coming i'm for it too yeah absolutely both um, good outcomes but i thought i thought you know in this instance she was going for something that was you know a little bit more than skin deep and she uh skin deep got heart deep for me hell yeah dude yeah and i'd love to go nude surfing but I, i'm not sure it, it would be as aesthetically pleasing as this movie now you're being hard on yourself i think a lot of people think that looks pretty cool oh thanks yeah they just have to work on my i think i'd have to you know just round out my ass a little bit more i'm I'm always working on that yeah, yeah. butt's tough yeah it feels like it's one of the harder ones to to build if you don't have it yeah just kind of genetically right that's my experience with it at least totally aaron who's your babe of the week um my babe of the week, <laughs> can you tell by the hesitation that I was looking at the photos of Skin Deep? Oh, <laughs> I <laughs> did it. You dog. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my babe of the week is a podcast that uh, just came back. It, it had its last episode about this time last year, and then it came back. It's called The Long Shot. Uh, it's with a couple people from, well, the, the show's on this network. It's uh, Sean Conroy. Um I love Sean Conroy. Yeah, he's a great U UCB performer and stand up. And um and uh Jamie Flam, one of the the owners and uh, founders guy. of Dynasty Typewriter, he used to book at the Improv. Yeah, so, yeah, he's awesome. He's an awesome dude. Yeah, awesome dude. And then uh Amber and Joe uh round out the cast. Eddie Pepitone used to be on it back in the day, but he went off to do his own thing, which is also on All Things Comedy. Check it out. Um so yeah, it just it came back they gave me the opportunity to produce the show, so I'm a little biased, but I'm also I was also a huge fan for years. So it's awesome. I'm so glad it's back. That fires me up. I love all those guys. I do too. Jamie gave us our first show at the improv and he was so cool and had such good taste in the people he would book on it and stuff like that. It, it, he's like a true uh like uh I don't know, knower of comedy. Mm -hmm. Not not just because he gave us a show, but yeah. because of the corresponding things. Yeah, yeah, you remember like the whole application process and we, when we got it, we were like, no fucking way. It was very surprising. Yeah. He really understood it. Yeah. We, it was, he, the, one of the questions was like, what extra equipment would you need or, or like uh, kind of stage dressing where like as many tiki torches as you got. This was yeah. before those were co-opted by other elements. Yeah. And he was like, he read. He said he read that, and he was like, "I'm on board." <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's really nice of him. Um, my babe of the week is a uh, Rob Blagojevich's hair. Rob Blagojevich, funny name. 
was the uh, governor of Illinois, and he's a disgraced governor. I think he's a convicted felon now, and he went to jail for a. Oh, I saw that. He sell he sold off some like Senate seat. He might have sold off Obama's seat. Yeah, it was Obama's seat. Yeah, after Obama left the Senate to be president. He was like pitching it to the highest bidder. I think at one point he was pitching that that Oprah should take it over. Really? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so he got he got booted from uh, from politics. I think he did Dancing with the Stars later though. And he was known for his flamboyant dress, but he also he's got this incredible head of hair. It's so thick. I think didn't Trump pardon him? Well, and I, like yeah, he after did for several years. Yeah, you know. he was in prison for nearly eight years, and then and then Trump said hair like that because that's the kind of hair that Trump aspires to. Oh, of course, yeah. And. Uh, and uh, he let him out. But his hair is just so thick, and he's well aware of how valuable his hair is because he demands that his aides always have a hairbrush nearby, mm -hmm. and he called the hairbrush the football, alluding to the nuclear football, mm. which never be out of reach of the president. Mm. So he'd be like, hey, give me the football so he could comb that beautiful mane. That's awesome. Do you yeah. have a photo of it? Yeah, let me pull it up. How long? He was in jail for like eight years? Yeah, I didn't realize he was in there for so long. I think he did... I think he did Dancing with the Stars right before he went to jail. Yeah. Which is hilarious. So look at that. Look how thick that mane is. Oh, my God. And that's him a bit older after he gets out of the slammer. Oh, my. Dude, he looks like he should be in Greece. Totally. Oh, look at him, dude. He's getting ripped. But, um, yeah. Hey, Rod. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry you had to go to jail for so long. But great hair. Yeah. Chad, who's your legend of the week? Uh, my legend of the week is my mom. Gotta give a shout out. Uh, my mom's best. Uh, she and I have just been chatting like almost every day uh, for quarantine. You know, just keeping each other company. Uh, just uh, and she's just the best. She's just always always happy. Uh, she got a new dog, Soleil. She always has the best pet names. They're always like French or you know, it's like Soleil, Anouk, um, and. Uh, so and it's a it's an amazing little golden puppy, and I'm fired up that Soleil is a a good dog for her. And uh, yeah, I just want to give a shout out for being you know great mom, and uh, thanks for being a good friend too. Nice. Yeah. Your mom's the best. Love you, mom. That's it. That's nice. <laughs> Let's just sit in this moment. <laughs> yeah. That's nice. <clears throat> Aaron, who's your legend of the week? Something not as uh, vital as uh, moms, but uh, my legend of the week is uh, Fig Newtons. Oh, dude, I just had one. Yeah, yeah. We have a box here at the studio, and I haven't had them in a long time. And, man, I, I just love a Fig Newton. I don't know what it is about it. Uh, the regular, you can get the flavors. Uh, grape was always pretty, co pretty cool, um, but pretty rare. Uh, and they're just amazing to eat. Super fun. Good texture. Good taste. Nice. They're fruit and cake. Yeah, they're so good. I had one that was just like, oh, yeah, what is it about them? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it is kind of a mystery. Yeah. My legend of the week is Tammy Taylor, Coach Taylor's wife from uh, Friday Night Lights. One of the coolest, most badass, that's not the right word, but one of the best characters in TV history. I mean, the whole show is just littered with great characters, but... She really comes through as just like the personification of dank household leader. Mm. And she's super smart, super compassionate, tough. And her and Coach, they have a really nice relationship. And then she ends up working at the school as like a guidance counselor. And then she moves up the ranks to principal. Guys, I'm spoiling a lot. Sorry. And it's just a great journey to go on with her. And she's a very compelling, uh, I don't know. She's very compelling. That's awesome. Chad. That's sick. What's your quote of the week? My quote of the week comes from the movie Torque, um, which, guys, I don't know if you remember, if you're a longtime listener, but I think on the second or third episode when we started doing Beefs, Babes, and Legends, my first legend was Martin Henderson from Torque. So it's kind of cool to, to come back to come back to that excellent, excellent movie. Um my, but my quote comes from Junior Wallace, who is Ice Cube's brother in Torque. And he, if you haven't seen the movie, he gets murdered pretty early on. But at the beginning of the movie, he's going to fight Martin Henderson because Martin Henderson blew past him and he was going so fast that Junior was taking a nap on his crotch rocket and fell off his crotch rocket. And then he's like pissed. 
and he, there's this cool shot where he just gets up and he he gets a, he has this like tough guy look where he's about to fight just... and so he uh races up to martin henderson martin henderson and he and he starts like knocking him and so martin henderson pulls over and they start like they're about to start you know grappling and getting into it and uh and then he's like to junior wallace is like to martin henderson he's like you've got loud pipes but you ain't saying nothing and that always stuck with me i've heard you say that before yeah that's where that came from it's one of my favorite quotes yeah what does it mean i don't know that's so sick yeah yeah <laughs> that's fire you got loud pipes but you ain't saying nothing could oh, you yeah. think you could? Do you think you'd have the right if you were in a if you're in a heat of battle? The with, gravitas. Yeah. If, if I were if I were about to throw down with like Griffin and his crew, would you be able to to throw down a line like that? Can I just try that one and yeah. see how it works? I could definitely I could definitely throw down a line like that. Yeah. Because I'm actually speaking in that dialogue. Anytime I'm driving somewhere, yeah. I'm just thinking about who I'm pissed off at and the yeah. badass shit I'm gonna say to him. Nice. Like, you sure you're ready to go to war with me, motherfucker? All right, because I will break you. I look forward to breaking you. I want to look at you when the strength leaves your eyes and you hand your fucking soul to me. <laughs> you fucking piece of shit. Okay? I'm looking forward to it. Who are you? Chad's buddy? Oh, hey, Griffin. <laughs> yeah, Griffin, I'm Chad's buddy. You're a kook. What'd you say, bitch? You're a kook. What'd you say, bitch? I said you're a kook. Dude, shut up. Sorry. What, uh, kook? Just Chad's buddy? You, you... Chad, you just going to have uh, your buddy come up here and talk shit to me? Shut up, Griffin. But no, now you say the line from Torque. Oh, yeah. Griffin, I got something to say to you. You got loud pipes, but you ain't saying nothing. That's awesome, dude. Dude, if you said that to him, yeah, I think that would really put him on defense. Yeah. And I hope he asked me what it means, and I say, I don't know. And <laughs> we both just sit there, and we're confused. And then I snake his wave and beat his ass. Confusion is very effective in conflict. Totally. If you say non sequiturs to someone, yeah. they don't know what to do with They think you. you're a psycho. They think you're a lunatic. Yeah. This isn't a non sequitur, but I did. I almost got into a, a skirmish in Newport Beach, and this guy was talking shit, and I was talking shit, and I just yeah. kept saying, get over here and get butt fucked. I was like, come over here and I'll butt fuck you. And there was like 20 people, and they were like, what's going on? And I was so dead serious. I was like, come on. Come over here. You want to get butt fucked in front of all these people? Yeah. And I remember my brother and Becca were in the cab, and Becca was like, go get your brother. And he's like, he's fine. He's fine. <laughs> my brother was like, it's not going to get serious. Dude, to add to it, you should have just taken your pants off. I should have already been hard. <laughs> but then like an old family friend was yeah. there and told my mom what happened, and she called me the next day and she was like John Thomas I heard you're getting into fights in public and saying crazy bizarre things is that true is it true why are you doing this yeah. I was like mom it's not a big deal I knew it wasn't serious <laughs> um. saying crazy bizarre things <laughs> <laughs> she was all scared she's like I heard the guy was big I was like you don't think I can butt fuck a big guy <laughs> when I gotta butt fuck that kid from the, the guy from the viral video in the donut shop <laughs> Remember that guy? <laughs> what? Yeah, what he was so funny. Uh, a bagel, a bagel boy or something. Bagel, bagel. What did he say again? Bagel boss. What bagel was, boss. What was yeah. the thing he said? Oh, I forgive it. It was so funny. He brought up women, right? Like how they ignore. Oh yeah. Him. He's like, you don't think I could get laid or something? <laughs> He's like, I don't know. Women ignoring me all my life <laughs> yeah. like that. Not looking at me? <laughs> yeah, like every other, lo every other woman. <laughs> he's going he's go on this rant about dating apps. He's like, you go on these apps, and then you start talking to them, you never hear from them again. <laughs> <laughs> Very relatable. <laughs> he's all famous. And he got all famous from it. He's like, I'm the bagel boss guy. That's me. And they cut the part out where the guy actually tackles him, which was one of the best parts <laughs> oh, of the video. Yeah. He gets smoked. I got to rewatch that, dude. I hope he has a resurgence. It was He was a great guy. I think it turned out he was racist. But, oh, yeah, but he, he gave a lot to that. the culture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He gave a lot to it. People him. interviewed him. They're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he said in that one interview that he took a bat into the forest <laughs> and just hit a tree for a while. Yeah, he took a bat to a tree. <laughs> I, love that. I could totally, I totally knew kids like that in high school were just so pissed, and then they just go to the just, mm, mm. That's hilarious. <laughs> what are, what are we on? Uh, quotes. Oh, so you quote. just did your quote, Aaron. What's your quote of the week? <laughs> oh, that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> 
my quote of the week is from my voice Jimmy World nice, the song dude. Clarity on the album Clarity which is one of the best albums ever made um, and maybe my favorite of theirs um, it's from the pre-chorus it just goes now in the deep end down your heart moves now in the deep end down I don't know how but I know I want out and I'm sure that's a breakup song but uh, I feel like that's what my baby is saying to my wife right now oh um, nice I want out <laughs> nice double meaning yeah Closing time. That's about a baby too. <laughs> what, what's the timeline, Aaron? Uh, we're uh, we're less than a week. So it could happen at any point, right? Are we in that? It could, yeah. But we're we're definitely going in on the seventh. Because because I remember in nine months and to bring back Hugh Grant, mm -hmm. the water That's breaks. Been at, my babe before I think her legend. Water right. Babe. The water breaks at dinner, just on a random, a random date night. Yeah, but with COVID, we're not having those. So, oh right, uh, true. So yeah, I, I mean, she's, she's, we're going in early, so, you know, it's not like we're at nine, the full nine or whatever. So, I don't think it'll be early. That's it's good though. It, it could. My quote of the week is also in honor of Aaron's baby, which is almost here. I'm so freaking jacked on this little person joining us in this existence and being on this round mound of rebound earth with us, this round ball. So my quote of the week is for is for your baby, Aaron, and for you. Okay. It's a it's a song by a band I like. Well, I just heard the news today. It seems my life is gonna change. I close my eyes, begin to pray, then tears of joy stream down my face with arms wide open under the sunlight. Welcome to this place. I'll show you everything with arms wide open. Dude, that last line, you nailed it. With arms wide open. I really like this part about self-hate. You don't have to give this to your baby, and I don't think it, it even fits with because you're such a legit dude. If I had just one wish, only one demand, I hope he's not like me. Man, I always related to that. Even as a ten-year-old, I was like, "Yeah, I hope he's not like me, man." <laughs> I was only ten. <laughs> Why did I not want my baby to be like me? But oh, he's talking about a baby. Is he's talking about his baby? He his, hopes he's not son. like him. Yeah, he goes, "I hope he's not like me." <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I hope. Well, I think he's saying. I think he kind of expounds on it in the next line because he's like, he's like, um, I hope he. I hope he understands that he can take his life and hold it by the hand and he can greet the world with arms wide open. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's more, he's just, I hope the kid's more open hearted. Mm. Yeah. But I just really fixated on the, the, the self-loathing of it. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, what's your phrase of the week for getting after it? Uh, let's pound some groms. It's, it's coming. It's coming. It's hunting season. I just got my. I just got my pass. I just got my. Uh, what do you get? What do you get when you license? I, I just got my license. It's hunting season. I just got my license. Looking for fourteen year olds. Yeah. Young bucks. Yeah. Gonna put their head on my wall, mounted. I'm gonna kill a fourteen year old. <laughs> Let me get a, the head on for that. I'm gonna kill a fourteen year old. Aaron, what's your phrase of the week for getting after it? <laughs> Let's make like a fetus and head out. Ooh. Oh, nice. Um, my phrase of the week for getting after it isn't even really a phrase of the week for getting after it. It's just a badass line from a cool movie. It's from the first Avengers, and Loki first comes down to Earth, and he's talking about how humans want to submit to like power and stuff like that. Like it feels better when we're subordinate. We're meant to be sheep. And then this old guy stands up, and he's like, no, 
you're like a bad guy. I don't forget. I don't forget the first part. And then, um, and he's he's like he's like I remember men like you. They can never be in charge. And he's like there are no men like me. And then the old guy looks at him, and it's clear this old dude has survived genocide and stuff like that. He looks at him and he goes, "There are always men like you." And I was like, "That's fire, dude." That's epic. There's always men who you know want to control others, but you've been here before and you, you we, you're gone now, dude. Mm. Although Loki kind of turns a corner and becomes a pretty chill character in like nine more movies after that. Oh, nice, nice. It would be tough being Thor's brother. Super tough, dude. Yeah. A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. And he's so jacked. Yeah. I would totally act out. You could work out all day and not get close to having his V. Mm-mm. His flow. He's got a big-ass hammer. Cooler name. He was a Loki. Yeah. You're like, Dad, Loki? Yeah, it's mischievous, but it's not powerful. Not no. like Thor, which is kind of short and, and stocky and strong. Yeah. As a word. You know Thor had pubes when he was like six. Is Thor on the table as a as a baby's name? <laughs> We're having a girl, so no. <laughs> well, I think it's a gender neutral name. I I suppose you could go Thora. Mm. But we're not really into that. I'm what, not. what about Black Widow after Sh- Scarlett Johansson's character? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say no on that one as well. Okay. Well, we're not done though. What yeah, about yeah, yeah. uh? Shoot, hit, hit me, hit me with them. We got a few days. What about Electra? Electra. Is that Jennifer Garner's character? Mm-hmm. Dude. Smoke. What about Daredevil? That's gender neutral for sure. Mm-hmm. If you think about it. Electra would mean she wants to kill my wife and sleep with me, I think. Oh, it's the reverse nice. of the Oedipal thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. That's cool. That's, yeah, cool. That's, that's, that's tricky for me. You think your wife would be a little bit upset by that? Yeah, yeah probably. That yeah, makes sense. Yeah. What about like Oedipus's daughter, Antigone? Whoa. Antigone's different, sure. That's a pretty legit name. Have mm-hmm. you thought about like going with like some Greek names like that? Perseus? No. I haven't thought about that. Helen? Atlanta? You could do Helen of Sparta Brungart. <laughs> <laughs> That's strong. Helen of, of St. Louis Brungart. Are you going to raise her to love the Padres? No, uh, wait, hold on. Are you going to... Sorry. <laughs> I'm from San Diego. Are you going to raise her to love the cards? I'm going to fight way harder than my wife will for her to be a Red Sox fan, so yeah. Dude, we're pumped, man. So by by the... Well, we're recording tomorrow, but in two weeks, you're going to be a dad, dude. Yeah. That's That's crazy. That's cool, man. Congrats. Congrats, Aaron. Aaron, you're my legend of the week, dude. You're my legend... You know what? Hold up. Uh Uh-oh. Don't mean to get dramatic here. You're my legend of the year. Whoa. Wow. That's incredible. Thank you. Wow. I concur with that. You're our legend of the year. I hope I'm not stealing your thunder. Not at all. I think you just added some more uh, power to it. Yeah. Our legend of the year. You can hear it from more miles away. Yeah. Thank you, my dogs. And when I meet little Helen of Sparta, (laughs) she'll be a legend. When I meet Thor, fingers you. crossed. Yeah. Don't worry, I'll come over and I'll bring a kettlebell. Because <laughs> I think she should start lifting fast, dude. I'll bring some sex wax. For surfing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know that. Okay, that's got to be cool. clarified. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's yeah. surf wax for your board. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's a good line to say to Griffin. Be like, hey, dude, I'm using my sex wax. Heard of the first part? <laughs> Dude, good call. Yeah, he probably is a virgin. I, I was doing a stand-up show one time, and these yeah. 17-year-olds came in and were, were being mean, and I just started taking it to him. I was like, I was, I was actually talking good shit. I was like, you're not even a real fucking person. You just come in here and act like an asshole because you don't know what it is to actually care about something, work for something, actually believe in something. You're just a little empty piece of shit. And then I went, and you're a virgin. <laughs> <laughs> And when Did I, that get him? No, when I got off stage, John Davies, you're, you know John Davies, great guy. He comes yeah. up to me, he's like, yeah, whenever someone yells at a teenager, they always bring up the virgin thing. I was like, damn it. John Davies. <laughs> he's like, that's where it always goes. Yeah. yeah. That's hilarious. All right. Well, uh, yeah, that's it. I think that's it. We're going to do some TikToks now. 
Yeah, guys, follow our TikTok, Randy, 30-year-olds. Uh, 30 is T-H-I-R-T-Y, not 3-0. Randy, 30-year-olds. Uh, we tried to go horny 30-year-olds, but TikTok was not cool with it. So we're Randy, 30-year-olds, though, and I'm owning it, and I love it. And check us out if you want us to see us just be super randy and horny. That's another beef right there, TikTok yeah. censoring us oh, because right. we're too old to be horny. Yeah. They let all the 17-year-olds be horny on there. Yeah. yeah. But if you're 30, you can't be horny. We'll get around to them. But, and, uh, but we're randy. That's cool, too. Yeah. Hell yeah. So thank you, Stokers. And look out for Helix beer bongs coming your way. All right. Thanks, dudes. Advice. These guys are really